Good morning, everyone. Before we start, we can kneel forward a prayer. You can kneel or you can just bow your heads where you are. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for bringing us to your courts today. I thank you so much, dear Lord, for the Sabbath and the blessing that it brings. I pray, dear Lord, as we sing, that you will lift our voices in praise to you and that you will bless this whole, um, this whole uh, Sabbath day as we listen to the sermons. I pray that it will be a blessing to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So our first song this morning is going to be number 370, number 370, which is called Christ for the World. song will be song number 372 um how bounteous are thy feet beauteous. so you huh? oh sorry how beauteous are thy feet thank you also bounteous probably <laughs> how beauteous <laughs> to be number 366, just a few pages back. 366, oh, where are the re reapers? Oh, where are the reapers at Canaan, the 
369, bringing in the sheaves. And may we stand at the call of the piano. Happy Sabbath, friends. How is everyone doing today? Blessed? Praise the Lord. You know, it says on the Sabbath day, we have special blessings that we don't get the rest of the week. Do you believe that? 
Um, this morning, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. So normally we have three different Sabbath schools in the family Sabbath school in the back. Um, but today, because uh, Dwayne Lemon is here, we have a special presentation today on how to study the Bible, which I think everyone will be blessed with. Um, we are, the, the, the family Sabbath school will still be meeting there in the fellowship hall. And I was asked to share a little bit about the family Sabbath school. These children are on a three-year systematic plan, and I was just told that they go through the Bible three times by the age that they're not of nine, and they also have gone through the Conflict of the Ages series three times. So it really does a, a, an impactful job to form these children. So they'll be meeting back there. Anyone who misses it in here, don't worry, it's going to be recorded so you can watch it. And I just want to share something um, briefly with you. This is taken from the Dire of Ages in the chapter of the Walk to Emmaus. These disciples, as they were listening to Jesus, it says, words of life and assurance fell from the Savior's lips. So as we receive the Word of God, it brings life, right? And you can get that from the Bible as well because it says, the entrance of thy words bring life. They bring understanding. It talks about Jesus, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Um, this morning, do you want God to speak to you? Do you want uh, Bible study to become more clear to you? Amen? Do you believe that God wants to do that for not just us here, but you individually? Do you believe he's that good? Praise the Lord. Um, what I'd like to do is have a short season of prayer here where we can just ask God to do special things for us in this hour. You know, uh, Dwayne Lemon was saying, when we come to God, we come to him specifically, right? We believe that, he's, that he actually wants to give us good things, and then we ask. And in addition to that, um, we want to make sure that our hearts... We're not holding sin against God, right? Because that can influence his ability to speak to us. So let's pray for those things while we're here, that as he presents, God would really speak to us. So I'm just going to start us off, and anyone who wants to pray, we'll just do this for a few minutes. There's a mic in the back, and I'll take the mic around. Um, and if you have a strong voice, while the mic is going to somebody else, don't worry, you can say your prayer in the meantime so we don't waste time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for these few minutes that we have, and we believe that when we ask you for specific things, that you will answer us. And so we pray for a blessing. We pray that if you, if you want to take away sin from our hearts, we pray that you would influence us corporately like that. Please put in our hearts the things that we should pray for this morning in preparation to receive your word. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, creator of the universe. We, your people, have come before you, open hearts, to be taught once more by you. So we ask your Holy Spirit to fill this place. You've told us in your word that we are naked before you, the discerner of our thoughts, our motives. We want Christ, his righteousness. Teach us today, Lord, we pray. Amen. Transformational, dear Lord, but be transformational, dear Father. Just open our hearts and our minds, write, carve your words upon our hearts, dear God, that we will not sin against you. Father in heaven, one of the most powerful prayers is the prayer of Jesus that I want to claim that for all of us today, that we might know you, the only true God, 
and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. We ask you, dear God, please dwell within us and let us dwell with you and bring in light, dispel all darkness because you've defeated darkness. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Kind and loving Father, how often do we deal with you as a treacherous woman who leaves her husband? Forgive us for our backslidings, Lord, and we ask that you would reconcile us to you, but that you also would reconcile us to our brethren, to our brothers and sisters. Where there is strife, where there is pride, and where there is unforgiveness, we ask that you would cover us in the blood of Jesus, and that you, Lord, would give us the courage and the strength to do what is right in your sight. And Lord, we ask and we claim your promise. Open thou our eyes, that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And Lord, we give you our hearts. We ask that you would take them, Father. And we ask that you would create in us a new life today. Baptize us with your, baptize us with your Holy Spirit. And infuse us, dear Lord, with the love of Christ. That the joy of the Lord may be our strength today. Help us, Father, that we may have spiritual discernment. And know, Lord, what you are asking us to do individually and collectively as your people. We thank you that it is not in our own strength and our own merits, but by, the, but by the power of your Holy Spirit. We give you thanks and glory because you are our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, you've given us something really good. Now let it burn in our bones as something we can't shut our mouths about. And may we find weary souls this next week that we must share your love with and give us the power to do so, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much that you're a very kind Father. And Lord, we thank you that you want to speak to us. Please forgive us for our sins, anything that comes between us and you. Father, help us to be reconciled not only to you, but also to each other, if there is anything between. Um, and Father, we humbly ask that your Holy Spirit would be here, that your angels would be here to impress our minds. Um, may this be practical experience for us, something that we will take home with us and apply. And if it's your will for small group Bible studies to take place on this campus, then we pray that as we listen, the importance of studying your word would be impressed on our hearts and that you would raise up certain ones that would feel the call to lead out in this. We thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. we we'll be able to get everything up on the screen. Well, let me go ahead and say good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. It's an absolute privilege to be here with you all on God's holy Sabbath day. And soon and very soon, we'll go ahead and have the uh, slides up on the screen. Now, we're going to pick up right where we left off yesterday. And I know that we just prayed. I just want to say one, I'm going to whisper just one more quick little prayer. Please bow your heads with me, Father in heaven. As we consider your wonderful words of life, Lord, help our minds to be in tune with you and with one another. And may you take us up just one round higher on Jacob's ladder, ultimately to arrive in the arms of Christ. This is our prayer we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Yesterday we were entertaining the question of Jesus where he asked, have you not read? And we were looking at how important it is to read the Word of God, to understand the Word of God. We're told in Proverbs 4 and verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. And so it is that when we talk about studying the Bible, we looked at several principles yesterday 
where if you're going to study the scriptures, you keep the theme in mind, you must make sure that you approach it with the right attitude, etc. But you also want to stick to reliable methods of study. You want to stick to reliable methods of study. And there are many different ways to study the scripture. There is something called the law of first mentions. There's typology. There is one of my favorites, which is interpretation versus application. That's probably one of my most favorite methods of studying scripture. Um, you know, often in Adventism, and we'll probably do an exercise in this, you know, sometimes we put applications before interpretations. That th this is a vicious habit in the Seventh-day Adventist church, and it has hurt us in more ways than we can ever imagine, is we start making applications to verses without even understanding what the verse is talking about. Um, a case in point is going to be Isaiah 28. So let's turn there very quickly. In Isaiah, the 28th chapter, you and I know that this chapter is a pretty famous chapter. And if any of us are students of scripture, then you cannot ignore how often Isaiah 28 is interpreted. In Isaiah 28, if you consider Isaiah 28 and we look at verse 10, when you look at verse 10, this is the text of scripture I'm sure many of us are familiar with. We talk about, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Now, what do we, all, what do we almost always say that this verse is teaching? How to study the Bible. I mean, like almost all the time we, we say that. And what we did, now it's not that we're wrong. It's not that we're wrong, but what's very deep is we completely bypass the interpretation of the verse, and we jump to an application of the verse. Yes, can Isaiah 28 verse 10 apply to how we should study the Bible? The answer is emphatically yes, but Isaiah 28 is talking about a very serious problem, and then it goes into a very powerful solution. And the problem was that the two people that God normally would use to bring the light of his love and his knowledge and his truth to humanity, we're both drunk. If you read in the previous verses, it literally tells us the priests and the prophets were drunk. They were so drunk, they were vomiting everywhere. And it actually, if you understand priests and prophets, these were the two integral people that God would anoint to communicate his love, his light, his truth, even his warnings. The prophet in 1 Samuel 9, 9 was first called a seer, which means they had the vision. They were able to see the things beyond what the natural mind and eye could see because of the illumination and inspiration of God's spirit. Prophets were the mouthpiece of God to the people. Priests were intercessors. And priests were representative of the people to God. So literally, through prophet and through priest, this is how heaven and earth would communicate. Are you following that? And so what ended up happening is the communication was broken because now the ones who normally would represent God to the people and the ones who normally would represent the people to God, the problem is they're now both drunk. So now heaven is having a problem communicating. And God loves to communicate with his people. So Isaiah asks a question, really God asks a question through Isaiah in verse 9. Verse 9 makes a lot of sense because if, if, if these two parties are drunk, then what do you think is the natural question in verse 9? Whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Because normally it would have been the priest, but they're drunk. Normally it would have been the prophet, but they're drunk. And look at God's answer. Those who are what? Weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. What do we call people like that? We call them what? We call them youth. We call them babies. And what God said, what God was saying, let me, let me see if I could pull this up. I'm, I'm going to pull this up. This is the Holy Spirit because this wasn't even in my study. Uh, let me see if I can pull this up for you very, very quickly. Yeah. If you carefully look at this, after it says, whom shall he teach now, to whom shall he make to understand doctrine? And it says, those who are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. This is obviously talking about young people. How are we going to teach the young people? It says, from one precept to another precept, from one line to another line, 
and then here a little, and there a little. Different stages of growth. At different stages of growth with these young people, we're going to teach them knowledge, and we're going to help them understand doctrine. This is where a scholar from Oakwood College, Oakwood University, a scholar challenged me on it. He challenged me on it. He said, you guys, he says, I don't like you guys. And I'll be honest with you, Brother Hargreaves, he, he actually said, I don't like you amazing facts people. That's, that's what he said. All right, he was a scholar. He said, I don't like you amazing facts people. And I said, tell me why. He said, because you guys keep using this proof, what do they call it, proof text method. You keep using this proof text method. I said, what are you talking about? And then he said, yeah, he says, you guys just pull verses out of their context and make it say stuff. And I said, and he said, let me give you an example. He said, Isaiah 28. Now, this conversation had to have happened like eight years ago. And he said, let me prove it to you. He says, Isaiah 28, verse 10. He said, what's it talking about? I said, it's talking about how God is going to impart knowledge and give understanding to young people at various stages of their growth. And it got quiet. He was expecting me to say, it teaches you how to study the Bible. He was expecting me to say that. Now, remember I told you that story about how there was a lady who was, um, who was very anti-Ellen White, anti-Spirit of Prophecy, and then I started to teach the Bible, and then she said, where'd you get that from? And then I told her how, hey, I learned it from these books. Remember that? I was reading the manuscripts. This is what it says. Now, this, this is, this, I read this, after I came to an understanding of Isaiah 28, just studying verse by verse, text by text. The servant of the Lord says, manifold teaching needs to be given. Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? That's obviously Isaiah 28, 9. Look at the next statement. The first work, what's the next word? Specified. The first work specified begins with the child in its mother's arms and continues through babyhood, childhood, youth, and manhood. Isn't that something? And when's the last time somebody broke that down to you from Isaiah 28? Are you following? So in other words, I get it. We, we love to make applications, but I, all I'm doing is I'm giving a very humble warning to God's people. If you really want to be prepared, we're told in the book Evangelism, page 69, that we're going to come up against the world's greatest minds and the world's greatest men. And then she says, and if they could pick the pieces what we believe, it will be done. And therefore, we need to study and we need to make sure we really know what we believe and what the word of God says. And in my mind, if we can be prepared to answer the scholar, we can be prepared to answer anybody else. Are you following? So, because we've already been warned by the prophet of the Lord, we've been warned that we're going to come up against the world's greatest minds. We're going to come up against the world's greatest men. God is going to find ways to put us in the front. That is an inspired statement. Because of that, family, we have to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, that we can be workmen and work women that need not be ashamed. For we are rightly, we're rightly dividing God's words of truth. And this is why my favorite part, I do a lot of examples of this when I do missionary training. We do a lot of interpretation before application. It's a very serious failure point in a lot of how we study. We, we jump to applications of verses. If I had to say to you, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Man, we start talking about, see, the Bible says plant-based diet. We, we immediately start going to that, and that's not, what, that's not what Paul was talking about. He was not talking about plant versus flesh. But here's the problem. Now, now watch, let me show you how this problem works. And I, I'm speaking to you. I, I really hope y'all get what I'm saying, because, you know, people love to make up stuff. You remember earlier in the week I told you about how important it is to study your Bible? Remember that? And remember that I told you that there's something that we all have. It's a gift. But we have abused the gift. And we have allowed the gift to turn our active minds into lazy minds. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? That beautiful gift of prophecy that has been given to us through the writings of, of, of Mrs. White, right? And you'll remember that what will happen is if you're the kind of person that says, 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, 
Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Hmm, I don't know what that means. So we go and pull up our software and we immediately go to Mrs. White. And then Mrs. White, this is where a lot of us get derailed. You will find statements where Ellen White has quoted Isaiah 28, 10 and referred to methods of study in the Bible. Am I right? You will find in the writings of Mrs. White where she will actually connect 1 Corinthians 10, 31 to the importance of eating a healthy diet. Am I right? What we don't do is find the other areas of her writings where she said that. The first work specified. Are you following? So what ends up happening is we're just happy that we know, I know Ellen White said it, so it's got to be right, and we just run off with applications while we totally missed the interpretation. The same thing happens with Proverbs 4 and verse 23. Let's turn there. I like this one because, you know, if, there's two, if I have two favorite subjects when it comes to my study of the Bible, all right, I don't believe I'm a present truth specialist. I, I, I like to study everything. But if there's two subjects that I have a great passion for in studying the Bible is the family and health in light of last day events. Those are my two favorite, 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 absolute favorite subjects that I love to study about and teach about and preach about is the family and health in light of last day events. Now, when it comes to the family, there is a statement in Adventist Home, I believe it's page 16, and it talks about the family, and it talks about how the heart, she, she quotes Proverbs 4, 23. Take a look at it. In Proverbs 4 and verse 23, the Bible says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. If you go to Adventist Home, page 16, you will see that she actually compares this verse to the home. And she talks about society, she talks about the community, and she talks about the church. And she says the heart of the community, the heart of society, the heart of our world, or the church, is the home. But before she quoted that verse, she, before rather she quotes Proverbs 4, she's actually talking about the heart being the home. This is what you call making an application. Are you following that so far? It's called making an application. But the first thing you want to do is get the right what? Interpretation. So if we were to just go through Proverbs 4, verse 23, very quickly. In Proverbs 4 and verse 23, the word keep, that's the first word if you're looking at a King James. The word keep, what does the word keep mean? Hold on, don't let it go. But in the Hebrew, the word keep means guard. So that means that sometimes when you study the Bible, it's actually okay to look up the original language on a verse. Sometimes that's going to be very helpful because there are going to be times that in our English language, the word might mean one thing, but in the Hebrew mind, it might mean something completely different. And it's never been easier to do this stuff. I mean, literally, I can go on my phone. I, I wish I could get my phone uh, connected to your screen, but I use an app called Touch Bible Loaded. That's an app that I use, Touch Bible Loaded. I use it to date. When I sit down and it's Bible study time, I got my app out, I got my software out, I got everything out, and of course my Bible, my books, and I'm just going to go ahead and have a wonderful time studying the Word. Well, if I were to go to Touch Bible, this is how easy it is. So when I, when I say the Greek, I just want you to understand it's never been easier, okay? And, and all the students of Scripture, we know this nowadays. Um, if I go ahead and pull up Proverbs 4 and verse 23, all I got to do is scroll. It's like a Rolodex. You just, you just scroll Proverbs, then 4, and then 23. So if I do that, right, Proverbs 4 and then verse 23, boom, there it is. Now, I know you can't see this. I get it. I just hope you can see this little action. I'm just going to tap the word keep. Tap it. Did you, did you see something drop? Did you at least see that? You know what just happened? It just gave me the Hebrew word for keep. That's how easy it is now. Are you following what I'm saying? You don't have to be this like deep scholar spending thousands of dollars to take some theological school to learn truth and error and learn how to filter out the error. Some of y'all didn't catch that, but nevertheless, it's all right. Anyhow, 
What I'm saying is, you, you, it's never been easier to look these things up. It's never been easier. The word keep means to guard. Then it says, keep your what? Your heart. What does the word heart mean? Mind. It's not talking about the thing in the center of our chest that goes boom, boom, boom. It's talking about your heart, your mind. So guard your mind. Then it says, let's see here, keep your heart with all diligence. What does diligence mean? Perseverance. I like that. Perseverance. I would add one more word to it. Effort. Effort. Detail. That's also a very good one as well. Guard your mind with persevering effort. Then the close of the verse gives you the why. It says for. The word for means because. Guard your mind with persevering effort because out of it, flows the issues of life. Give me another way of saying that. Put some skin on that for me. What's another way of saying issues of life? Everything that you do? Things that are important to you? Okay. So let's, let's paraphrase our verse. Guard your mind with persevering effort because out of it flows all of the things that are important to life. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know that you just gave the interpretation of the verse? You just gave the interpretation of the verse. Now you're fulfilling Solomon's words. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get what? Now you understand what Proverbs 4.23 is saying. Now watch that. That's what the interpretation of the verse is. Now let's take physiology and make an application. Physicians, nurses, doctors, health workers, you'll appreciate this. Now we can do the same thing. Guard your actual heart with persevering effort because every time our heart pumps, it pushes out issues of blood. Isn't that right? So now we can take this same verse and now we're making a physiological health application to it and saying, my friend, you want to consider Proverbs 4.23. You must guard your heart. Mr. Johnson, you see how you're going through heart failure right now? God's counsel to you in Proverbs 4.23 is he wants you to guard your heart with persevering effort, Mr. Johnson, because out of it flows all that blood that's going to help produce that life in you. And you came here to use you because you want to live. So now, did you see how we're taking that verse and we're making a beautiful application? Yes? In like manner. Guard your home with persevering effort because out of our home affects all the circumstances of the church, society, and the world at large. Are you following that? Another application. Why are we making such profound applications in health and in the home? It's because we came out with a right what? Interpretation. So if you get a strong interpretation, if you get a right interpretation, what is the text saying? Once you understand what the text is saying, don't add to it and please don't take away from it. Just say what the text is saying. Once you understand that, now it's a whole lot easier to make sweet applications. I don't know about you, but you know, again, in our movement, we have people who like to make applications to verses and say very strange things, very concerning things, very home-destroying and life-destroying things. And so I've seen the blessing of right applications, and I've seen the curse of wrong applications. And so when it comes to studying our Bibles, when it comes to Jesus asking you that question, have you not read? Remember, he doesn't want you to just read. He wants you to read right. He wants you to rightly divide the words of truth. Amen? Amen? Now let's go ahead and let's have some enjoyment here. I, I, like enjoy, I enjoy studying the word. I mean, this gets me fired up because you talk to a brother. I, I mean, I'm a walking miracle. Y'all don't understand. I, I am, I'm a high school dropout. It's like, according to the world standard, I am a very dumb man. And what I'm saying is, is that what, I, what, what gets me excited about it 
is to see what God can do with such a dumb mind. And to imagine, now some of you are educated, which means that you should be way past a lot of the dumb minds. When you study the Bible, beloved, like I told you earlier in the week, when you study scripture, that thing, it ignites your mind. It lights up. It, it does something on a very powerful, beautiful, and even physiological level of allowing us to be able to see and understand things now that in any other case we could not see nor understand. So please understand that when I, when I say I'm excited, I'm just, I'm constantly reminded, look at what God can do with a mind that used to mess around with a little bit of weed and used to mess around with a little bit of alcohol and used to eat everything that could move and do a lot of stuff that was damaging to my mind. That's why I love this church. That's why my commitment is to, you know, my commitment is to Jesus above all things. Amen. But I'm very appreciative for this movement. I know how to look beyond people's actions and focus on the message and the movement. Because if you get caught up in people's actions, you will leave this church. Are you following? You sometimes, sometimes when bad stuff happens to us and then we leave the church, Jesus sometimes comes to us and says, I just got one question for you. What did I do to you? I want you to listen carefully to that. Sometimes we leave the church and you say, why did you leave the church? Because this person is so mean and this person is so ungodly and these people are so nasty and these people don't care and the list goes on. Now, you know, that needs to be addressed. That needs to be addressed. But that's not why I joined. That's not why I joined. I didn't join because it was just filled with a bunch of nice people. Because I can go, I can go, I'm not joking. I can go around a bunch of homosexual people and find a bunch of nice people. Some of the nicest people in the world. I'm serious. I, I'm very serious. I have been around individuals who live a homosexual lifestyle, and I'm like, man, obviously there's some things that need to be adjusted here. But wow, you guys are very loving people. Probably because they know what it is to be judged. So what I'm saying is, is that that's not why I joined this movement. I didn't join this movement because it's filled with a bunch of nice folks. I'm glad that there's a bunch of nice folks. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm glad. I'm glad. I've met some amazing people in this movement. And you're here as well. But I'm just saying that's not why you joined. We join because of the message, and we join because of the movement. And that, I've never been part of a church that teaches health. I've just never been, I, I mean, health? It was all about the spirit, man. And so I'm very grateful. Now, go to Matthew chapter 5, and I just want you to see something here. Let's do something. This is, this is a method of study here that is just absolutely amazing. Let me go ahead and show it to you. Method of study. Very, very good. All right. Yeah. Okay. Like we said, if we were talking about have you not read, stick to reliable methods of study. The first thing you want to do is you want to read contextually. Context, okay? Whenever, whenever you study the Bible, you want to make sure you're looking at things in its proper context. Now, because I already did this exercise with you, I, I realize that your, your, your minds are already going to be in very deep thinking mode, so this is good. When you look at Matthew 5, let's look at verse 48, another popular text amongst those of us who believe the present truth. In Matthew 5, and verse 48, Jesus says, Be ye therefore what? Perfect. Even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Do we believe that people can be perfect? Do you believe that? Do you believe that people can live a lifestyle where they no longer fall into sin? Do you believe that? All right, this is called victory over sin. We believe that. This is one of our unique features of our movement. It's one of the unique things we believe. It's one of the relevant points of Christ being in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary is he is perfecting a people because one day we're going to have to stand before a holy God without a mediator. That's right. Now, no problem with that, agree 100%. But here's the thing. Somebody comes to you and says, are you kidding me? No, nobody's perfect. Who could be perfect? And we get kicked back. And I would like to say, I, I wish I could say, yeah, we get kicked back from people outside the church. 
But if somebody came to you and says, listen, I was reading Matthew 5, 48, and I, I saw this thing telling me to be perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. If somebody said that to you, far right, let's start here. They say, what, 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 is, what, is, what does God want me to be when he talks about being perfect? What would anybody here say, just to my far right, if they said, be perfect? I've read it in Matthew 5, 48. I see that God wants me to be perfect. Can you help me understand what does he mean by perfect? Is he actually saying he wants us to like stop sinning, be sinless, uh, to never make a mistake again? What does this word perfect mean? What would you say? So anybody here from the right? Don't worry, I'm going to come over here too. Say again. Finished. Finished. Obedience. Be like Jesus. Wonderful. Okay, yes. Perfect in Jesus. Go ahead. Go ahead, sister. Oh, I'm sorry. They want us to use the, use the mic. I'm just bringing the mic to you. Go ahead, sister Audrey. Raise your hand, sister. So, yeah, there you go. Thank you. In Acts of the Apostles, page 566, I think, it speaks of an, an implied definition of perfect when it says that just as Christ is all, for us in the presence of the Father, so we are to be all for him Amen. in this life. And that means everything he's given for us, so we give everything for him. Wonderful. And that's perfect. Okay. Now, I'm going to add something to my question. For now, I want you to talk to me like I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. I want, in other words, if I was a non-Adventist, I may not know about Acts of the Apostles 566. Obviously, as a Seventh-day Adventist, love the book, appreciate the teachings in it very much, and agree. But let's talk to one as if we're, we're not Adventists. Let's say we're just studying with somebody. We're trying to help them come to the light of God's truth. All right? Yes, my sister. If we learn to say yes to Jesus all the time, mm. he is willing to be perfect in us. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's move over to this side. All right, we got two hands. My brother here and then my sister here. Luke 6, 36 and Jeremiah 9, verse 23 and 24. Okay, very good. I'm going to pause on those verses. I'm not going to go there yet, okay? But thank you for it. I got you. We're going to come back to that. I'm going to be transparent. I don't think that I can be perfect in how I see perfection. Okay. That is... In my mind, perfection is I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not thinking the wrong things. I'm not saying the wrong things. And maybe that's just too concrete because I am a concrete person. Okay. Um, what I see as perfection is when, when the Holy Spirit says to me, Marcia, you, you should have done better with that. You didn't say the right thing. You didn't do that. I'm going to repent and I'm going to ask God to give me the strength to do it differently the next time it comes. Okay. So in my mind, perfection means I'm constantly growing in grace and my experiences that I'm recognizing when I'm making mistakes and asking the Lord to direct me on the right path. That's what perfection means for me, that the more I do that, the more I am being perfected, the more perfect I'm becoming. But I don't believe that in this sinful world, with all the distractions, just me, I'm not talking about anybody else, I'm talking sure, about me, sure. yep. that um, in myself, I don't have the capacity to be perfect. My perfection comes when God shows me that I'm not doing what I ought to do and that I correct it. Understood. Thank you very much, sister. We'll take these two comments, and then we're going to move to this last one, just doing a slight time management. Go ahead. I just think, um, when I think of perfection, I think of um, my daily habits, my, my practice, my, you know, what, what do I... What do I do on a daily basis? So God says to do right, to obey his word, to keep his command. And so it's, it's my practice. It's my habit. All That's right. That's what I think of. Excellent. Thank you, sister. Brother Eric, go so ahead. So you said um, in the context it's talking about love. So perfect in love. And then Luke says um, merciful. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Last here. Anybody with a comment? Yes, Sister Janet? Um, so just to be brief... If I were speaking to someone and they asked that and we didn't have much time, I think I would just have to say what John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God that okay. takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Because if they go to the Bible and they behold Jesus, then they will begin to see what sinlessness is and be transformed in the present in the um, process. Awesome. You can give it to Sister Audrey. Was there another hand here? Okay. Yes, sis. 
I understand perfection to be living up to all the light you have by the power of Jesus. Amen. Yes, it is by faith, but the Lord will not hold me responsible for that which I do not know. But mm -hmm. as long as he reveals that to me, to take the power he's giving me to live up to all of that. Amen. Thank you. Sister Audrey, you'll be the last comment. Um, I understand perfection to be an, uh, a progressive and also it, the example would be a seed. It is a perfect seed. Um, the seedling is a perfect seedling. Mm -hmm. But there's, it's grown from a seed to a seedling. Yes. A seedling, then you have a plant, a fuller grown, a more mature plant. Mm -hmm. It's perfect plant, but it still has growth. And the scriptures tells us a just man falls seven times, but it gets back up. Gets and back up the, the righteousness, the perfection is not our own, it's Jesus. Amen. Sister Audrey, if you don't mind, can you bring the mic over to Sister Chrissy? Sister Chrissy, you'll be the last comment on this. Okay, this is not a comment, but it's a question. Okay. Um, okay, so the definition of perfect, is that the completion of sanctification? One might believe that, yes. That based even on most of the comments that I've I've heard, I would think that that's one of the conclusions for sure. Because if we try to be perfect, would that be rushing the work of sanctification? I think it's a great question, and it depends on our application of this trying to be perfect. Paul says, "I die daily." That's a healthy way to allow God to perfect out His character in us. But then there's some others who Perform it in very unhealthy ways, and there it could be very detrimental, where you're almost measuring yourself every day. Did I sin today? Did I sin today? Oh, yeah, that's, what, I'm, that's what I meant. Yeah, Are you know, and then to... yeah, it becomes tormentous to us, quite honestly. So no, that's a bad way. It's a okay. very bad way. All right? Paul's counsel is very, very clear. Our job as Christians is not to say, am I perfect yet? Am I perfect yet? Am I perfect yet? Am I perfect yet? Job 9 and verse 20, the Bible says, if I say I am perfect, I prove myself perverse. So... If you ever arrive to the day that you can say you're perfect, guess what? You're no longer perfect. I hope you caught that. And again, read Job 9, verse 20. You'll see it for yourself. So, you know, no, that's not what we do. Paul's counsel is very clear. The job of the Christian, male or female, young or old, the job of the Christian is forgetting the things that are behind and reaching for the things that are before. That's the lifestyle of the Christian. We let God get the last say of who's perfect and who's not. Jacob thought he was a terrible sinner and God had to inform him that he was an overcomer. Are you following? And we are told that God's people, Jeremiah 30, five through seven, God's people are going to go through a time of Jacob's trouble, which means we're gonna have the same experience. The closer you get to Jesus, the more you're going to see your imperfections. Amen. And Christ is going to be the one to surprise us Amen. and say, you're actually an overcomer. Amen. And so my job is not to say, am I perfect yet? Am I perfect yet? My job is to forget the things that are behind and keep reaching for the things that are before and pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, 14 through 16. That's our job. You follow that? And if you do that, life sure does get a lot easier. Seriously, trying to measure your perfections, man, that's just an invitation to stress. It's like, seriously, it is. Don't do that. Just, just forget the things that are behind. Reach for the things that are before. If you fall down, confess your sins. 1 John 2, 1 is very clear. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. But if any man sin, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You understand? So if you fall down, understand why did I fall. Confess your sin. Say, all right, Lord, help me to do it again. And with greater determination, focus, and with some learning, go forward. All right? All right. I want to go to Matthew 5. Let's, let's take a look at it. Because of all the answers that I received, of all the answers that I received, only two were on target. Matthew 5. Of all the answers that were given. In other words, it's not that your answers were bad answers. That's, that's not it. But it's not in harmony with the context of what Matthew 5 was talking about. 
I heard a lot about victory, overcoming, sinlessness, flawlessness, total surrender, and all these things. These are things that obviously must take place in the Christian life. No question about it. These are things that must take place. But that's not the context. That's not the context. Matthew 5, let's just take a look at it. If we go to Matthew 5, the best, one of the most amazing sermons that Jesus ever gave, of course, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, when we look at Matthew 5, I'm just going to go back a little bit. Again, I'm doing this for time's sake. In Matthew 5, if we just go ahead and uh, let's say we start at verse 38. All right? 38. So we'll do 10 verses, right? 38 to 48. If we add Matthew 5 and verse 38, Jesus says, You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He then says, But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Question. Question. Let's just, let's talk a little bit about this. All right. Question. Let's say somebody walks up to you. You're like, hey, happy Sabbath. And they're like, hi. And they just smack you in your face. Right? So let's just say that happens. Right? You are obviously like, what in the world? You know, you're, you're really frazzled by what just happened to you. Right? You just got smacked. Now, <laughs> amen. We all need some help. We all need some help. <laughs> all right. I understand. I understand. I understand. All right. Now, you get smacked, you're like, oh, Lord, help me. You know, because why are we saying, Lord, help me, Jesus? What, what's the natural reaction? Hit him back. Hit him back. Okay, right? That's the natural reaction, natural human reaction. Now, here's, here, here's the deal. Here's the situation. So, you know, go ahead, sister. What you got? Oh, they, they want you to talk in the mic. So, I, say I it in the mic again. I don't think all oh our Jesus would come to your mind. Somebody smack you, you smack them back. Afterward, you remember all oh our Jesus. <laughs> I'm being straightforward. I, I understand. I, I understand. I understand. <laughs> that human nature, right? Human nature. Mm -hmm. I get it. So the, the point is, is that when you get hit, come on. not only is the natural human response to say, okay, bow, and then you hit them back. But we would think that that's the right thing to do. And even Jesus is kind of speaking in this vein because he says, you've heard that it was said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, probably smack for smack, right? <laughs> now Jesus comes along and he tells us to do something completely different, completely different. You just smacked me. I have a right to smack you back, even according to the laws of the land. I have a right. So when you do something wrong to me, and I have a right to do that wrong thing back to you, but because of something we're going to read in just a little bit that is a very good thing called love, Amen. I'm going to not give back to you the thing that you did to me, though you deserve it. Come on. Come on. I'm not going to give that back to you. Instead, I'm going to give you something as if you actually shook my hand rather than smack me. We call that being what to that individual? What are we being towards them? You, somebody said gracious. There's a word that is synonymous to gracious. Merciful. Merciful. Very good. You're being merciful. Jesus is literally, he's trying to teach what God has been to us. Are you following? And what we have been to him. And then now he's saying, and now this is what I want you to do to others. Amen. Okay? Amen. This is the lesson. This, this, was, this was very foundational to so much of the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount. What God has been to us, which is good. How we have been to God, which is bad. But if we realize what God has been to us, then we should now go do thou likewise to others. Amen. Amen. That literally is the whoop summary of the Sermon on the Mount. Amen. Okay? Amen. Now watch this. Let's continue in the verses. Let's just continue. So now we're looking at verse 39, verse uh, 40. 
Jesus is now just, he's just bringing it home. He's just bringing up new scenarios, different scenarios, but he's bringing up the same point. Verse 40, and if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Same principle. Would you agree? Same principle governing. Then, 41, and whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. 42, give to him that asketh thee from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. You have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Verse 44, but I say unto you, do what? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So he's literally summarizing, all I'm trying to teach you is don't just love people that love you. I want you to learn how to love people that don't love you. Personally, I believe this is the last work to be accomplished in the minds and hearts of men and women before we go to heaven. This is the finishing work. Because I can eat veggie meat. I can dress with the thing all the way up to my neck covering my toes. I can do all of that. Now, I say this as one that is a health reformer. I am a health reformer by the grace of God. I firmly believe and teach dress reform. I believe in these things. I'm not one of these ministers that go around mocking God's reforms. That's not me. I believe in the reforms firmly. I just believe they're fruit, not root. That's the difference for me. Fruit, not root. It's a fruit. Good dress, fruit. Good diet, fruit. Country living, fruit. I say this as a man who lives on the mountains with the bears, the lions, and the rattlesnakes. That's where I live. So again, I I believe in all of these messages. I, I don't dumb down country living. I think it's one of the most relevant teachings that we need to go over. I believe in all of these things. But these things are fruit. You could move to the country and demons could say, hey, pack your bags, we're moving. Demons move with people in the country. You understand that? These things don't make you a holy man or a holy woman. Some of us have figured this out already. So this is not what God is saying. But I want us to understand, to love as Jesus loves your enemies, that requires conversion. There's no way you can fake that. There's no way you can duplicate that. You must, I must be born again. So Jesus is trying to bring this thing home in verse 44. Then he gives rationale to his uh, teachings in verse 45. So let's now go to verse 45. He says, that you may be the children of your father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For, because if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. Jesus is making it clear, I want a distinction between my children and the devil's children. And he's literally highlighting, loving even your enemy? Jesus says that is a beautiful distinction between my children and the devil's children. Being merciful to people who absolutely don't deserve mercy? They are 100% guilty? There's no question marks. They are guilty. And God says, I've given you all power to do whatever you want to be done to that person. What do you want to do? (laughs) And can you imagine like Moses, Lord, they have sinned a great sin. Lord, I'm asking you to forgive them. And if you won't, My heart is so linked with them. If you won't forgive them, Father, then blot my name out of the book of life. Can you imagine you have that attitude? We could fast and quickly get out of this world into the kingdom if we can have that mind. Now, Verse 46, for if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. And then the crowning verse. Be ye therefore. The word therefore means as a result of all of what I just taught you. Be you therefore perfect. Question. Now 
what do you think the word perfect really means? Yeah. Loving, but remember, hold on. Yes, loving, but we, we, gave a even, we gave a word that was even with greater specificity. We talked about when somebody does wrong to you, and we have a right to do the wrong back to them, and we choose. We have the right and we have the power to do the wrong back to them, and we choose not to do that to them and to give them something better in return. We are being what towards them? We're being what? Merciful. merciful. One second. Merciful. Are you following that? We're being merciful. So how is the love of God being manifested? By us being merciful to those people. Is this the context of Matthew 5, 38 all the way down to 48? Is this the context? Is this what it's talking about? Remember, stick to what the verse is talking about. Is that right? Okay. So then if I were to take the word perfect out, and if I could put another word in, what word would you put in? Be ye therefore? Now, you just did an amazing interpretation of the verse. You just did that. All you did was you looked at the verses before. You followed and saw what each of the verses are talking about. Now, what is the meaning of the verse? That's what you just did. But now we're going to do something called cross-reference. I'm finding this, too. I'm finding that Luke often clears up what Matthew has said. And Luke was a physician. See, physician, if, you read, if you read Ministry of Healing, we're told that those who are physicians and gospel workers, you can do the most effective work. So maybe that's one of the reasons why Luke was clearing up a lot of stuff. I don't know. But listen to this. Matthew makes statements that's not necessarily confusing, but you, you got to do a little bit more homework on it. But if you cross-reference and go to Luke 6, let's go to Luke 6 now. If you cross-reference Luke 6, like I said, there's only two people, my brother here and my brother here, that made reference to Luke 6. And I said, ah, praise the Lord. If you go to Luke 6, it's the same sermon. It's the same sermon. How do we know it's the same sermon? Look at verse 27. Luke 6 and verse 27 says, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Is this not the same sermon? Okay, so it's the same sermon on the mount. But by the time you get down to verse 36, what language does Luke use? Luke says, be ye therefore, even as your Father which is in heaven is. Congratulations, you just did a beautiful study, and now you understand what Jesus was saying. Now, can we make an application to Matthew 5, 48, where we can talk about the importance of overcoming sin and these type of things? Can we make that application? Sure you can. You can make that application. But is the interpretation of Matthew 5, 48 talking about flawlessness and victory over sin? Is that what it was talking about in Matthew 5, 48? No, it was very specific. Be merciful to people who absolutely don't deserve it. Because that's exactly what God was towards you. That's directly what Matthew 5, 48 was talking about. Are you following that? And so, family, this is what I mean when I talk about the importance of read, study good, good Bible methods, apply good Bible methods. When Jesus says, have you not read? He's talking about what we just did. He's talking about that and then some, and then some. I dare not limit the words of our Savior, our master teacher. I dare not limit it to what we did this morning. But what I'm telling you is that if we include this in our Bible study life, family, you, you, you're going to understand wondrous things out of God's word. You're going to fall in love with Jesus. And as a result of falling in love with him, I've learned something about love. You, you, there, there's something special that happens, something very special that happens. I was on the phone last night with my wife. I looked at my phone at one point. And it said one hour and 52 minutes and 33, 34, 35, 36. And I'm thinking to myself, like, isn't this something? 27 years later, <laughs> and we still have average two-hour conversations just talking about stuff. It's not like we're going into anything deep. We just love hearing each other's voice. 
And it's funny because one of the great joys of my life is finding new ways to please my wife. And I thought to myself, I was like, Father, this is why Steps to Christ, page 10, says, through the tenderest of earthly ties that human hearts can know, God has sought to reveal himself to us. There's no more tender tie than the relation between a husband and a wife. There's no more tender tie than that. In God's ideal, it may not be a lot of people's reality, and an enemy hath done this. But in God's ideal, there is no more tender tie that human hearts are to know than when we come together in holy matrimony. And God is trying to communicate to us that when you really love your wife and when you really love your husband, you start getting out of yourself and you start finding ways. How can I please you? How can I just put one more smile on your face? How can I help with some of the things that you're battling with? And how can I make those burdens a little lighter? And God is saying, I've given you this position, Dwayne, because I am allowing you to have the opportunity of opportunities. I want you to show your wife who I am. And when I began to understand that this is the secret of marriage, my success in marriage is when my wife can say, as a result of the witness of my husband, I have come to know Love, dedicate, and surrender my life to Jesus Christ. Amen. That's when I can say, now I know I did my job. I did my job as a man. I did my job as a husband. And until I have accomplished this, and until you have accomplished this, we still have more work to do. God wants us to understand that all of your I got to's when you walk with Jesus turns into I get to. And that's when religion becomes sweet. That's when it's no longer a burden and, oh, I got to keep the Sabbath. No, I get to keep the Sabbath. I got to eat this way. No, I get to eat this way. I got to worship God according to all these rules. No, I get to worship God because of these amazing ways that he expresses his guardian love over me. It's like all of your I got to's turn into I get to's. And my hope and my prayer is that this is what Bible study will do for you. Don't just become an intellectual giant that just knows how to shut all the arguments down. Paul did that in Athens in Acts 17. Ellen White called it a failure. Our goal is not to shut down all the arguments. Our goal is to win people. It's to win them to Jesus, to present Christ in such a way that it makes Jesus irresistible. And I know, I saw it in your faces. You had a good time studying his word this morning. I saw it in your faces. Your countenances speak louder than even your words. And that's what Christ wants. He wants you to have that. We get to have this every morning, every night. <laughs> you know, we get to have this. We get to go to his word and, wow, Lord, and behold him. You have that access. My hope and my prayer is that you take advantage of that access. Yes, my brother. Oh, I still have 15 minutes. Okay, Brother Andrew, go ahead, man. I just... Oh, thank you. Um, appreciate how you broke that down. And I just wanted to um, ask, would you say the same thing about context, meaning of the verse applies with um, the deeper meaning of the verse uh, for Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6 through 9? Mm -hmm. I think we often maybe quote that out of context. Okay. Um, and I'll just read the verses. It says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And here's the verses where we often quote, uh, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways my thoughts than your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so following the same principle of, you know, looking at the context, uh, verses 8 and 9 comes after verse 6 and 7. And verse 7 in particular says something that we could 
highlight, it says, and he will have, concerning the unrighteous man, the wicked man, it says he will have mercy upon him, mm-hmm. and he will abundantly pardon. Yeah. Then right after it says, for my ways are not your ways. So would you say that that's the same type of situation there? That It, it, it can be depending on what one walks away with. Mm-hmm. So depending on what they're reading and how they're applying this, then yes, it could be a, a, a wrong interpretation. Like I told you all, one of the great challenges that we have in the movement, and, and I'm sure if you search your own Bible study life, you'll see you probably did it. You'll see, like I did. I, I, I made tons of mistakes. I gave, I gave strong sermons using 1 Corinthians 10.31 to encourage people to move from an animal-based to a plant-based diet. I did that. And a lot of people were like, amen. And listen, and amen. It's like I'm glad that they made the change. You see, true Bible study works like this. Is a friend of mine by the name of Eugene Pruitt, very good Bible teacher, very good Bible teacher. And he, he was teaching a class at Wachita Hills Academy and College. I was there many, many years ago. And he said something, and when he said it, I was like, oh, I love that. I was like, that's really good. And, I, and it made me start thinking. Here's what he said. It is not so much that you come to a right conclusion. But the real question is, how did you get there? Listen to those words of wisdom. That's, I mean, that's, that's just, oh, that was so wise. It is not so much that you come to right conclusions, but the real question is, how did you get there? I have now been involved in Bible study long enough that I see people come to very good conclusions but they took very bumpy road paths of study to get there. They really messed up the scripture in their journey to come to the right conclusion. That's not what God wants. He wants you to not only consider the right conclusion, he wants you to consider the path of how you came to that right conclusion. This is good Bible study. This is very healthy Bible study. And I, unfortunately, am seeing a lot of people who were high in our ranks, who were, you know, I, I've, I've pretty much worked with, with a lot of the, the big names in Adventism and, and all of that, and that's fine. I'm grateful. It's, it's nice to meet a lot of, of God's people, even working in high places. But I've also seen a lot of them turn their hearts away from God. I've seen a lot of these people apostatize, start believing all sorts of strange doctrines and everything else. And it, it caused a bit of trembling with me. I'll be honest with you. I said, Lord, these people, in my opinion, are mental giants. Like, they, they know more than I know. So why am I still here? And they're leaving. And there were times that I'd be on my knees asking God those questions. Like, it, it began to put a little bit of serious concern in my heart. Like, Lord, if this brother's getting derailed and deceived, and this person's getting derailed and deceived, what about me? And I would just go ahead, and the only one thing that I can say is, is I'm just very genuine with God's Word. I have no problem going before a crowd and apologizing, like, hey, you know what, I, I taught something um, that was incorrect, I want to apologize, I want to stand corrected, and so on. You know, it's like, I'll do that, because the, probably the greatest fear that I have is deceiving a child of God. Like, seriously, I don't want to be the, I don't want to be the reason that somebody would lose sight of Jesus. I don't want that on my name. You know what I mean? So, you know, that's one thing that I'm very genuine about with the Lord, but we are seeing people that are turning away. Apostasy is around us. It's, it's all over. And it's coming from every angle. And this is why you got to be rooted in Christ. You have to be. There's no choice. For me, losing is not an option. And I'm very serious about that. I've come too far. Losing is not an option. There's no way I'm going to be in this movement and be in this faith just to get caught up in stuff and and end up being lost anyhow. That would be a tragedy. So wherever I need to adjust, I need to adjust. Whatever I need to unlearn and learn again, I'll unlearn and learn again. But my only thing is is don't come to me with any foolishness. I'm not going to accept what anybody says. I don't care how influential you are. I don't care how powerful your influence. I don't care how many quotes from Ellen White and everything else. Way before I joined this church, I used to listen to a televangelist by the name of Jack Van Imp. Mm. <laughs> Some of you might know who he is. Yes. He, was, he was a pretty well-respected uh, televangelist. And, and Jack Van Imp, I remember one of the reasons why I concluded. It was like I could see the hand of God leading me in my past. 
I wasn't Adventist yet. I was just trying to find God, and I'm watching this televangelist, and this brother would, I mean, he would give you 10 Bible verses between every point. And he would just say, such and such and such because, and he would just give all these Bible verses, all these Bible verses. And I remember I was like, he has to be right. He's quoting so many verses. <laughs> now, he was teaching the secret rapture. But he gave a lot of verses. And so I'm just like, wow, I couldn't wait till every Sunday. I said, you know, every Sunday come, boop, Jack Van M. And I'd have my Bible out, and I'd be like, okay. He said, turn here. Yep. Okay. He said, turn here. And I'm just going with this brother. And here it is. I come to find out he was dead wrong. Now, when I joined the church, there used to be a time that I was very impressed with people who could quote Bible verses from memory. I'd say, how do they do that? Man, Lord, can I learn how to do that? You know, I mean, I, I just want to know. And then one day I went to a church in North Carolina, and this brother just started not only quoting the Bible, this brother was like, Desire of Ages, page 633, paragraph 2. And I was like, what? You could learn how to quote Ellen White? And I'm just like, oh, I got to learn that. Because Desire of Ages, page 309, says the great mistake of the Pharisees was that they thought that an intellectual ascent to truth constituted righteousness. That was me. That was 100 me. I was like, man, the more that I know, it means I'm just one step into heaven. It's like I literally believe the more that I know, the more that I can quote, the more that I can lock in my head, this means I am a man of God. Boy, did I discover that that is so far from the truth. And it doesn't, it, this doesn't mean that I'm promoting ignorance. No, you got to study. You got to study. You got to know what you need to know. You need to, you need to understand. But above all things, Jesus says, is this producing Christ's likeness in your life? If all, all of these quotes and verses and everything, if it's not producing Christ's likeness in your life, we have ourselves a very serious problem. And so now today, I'm not impressed. I'm appreciative when someone can quote Bible verses from memory. I'm, I'm very appreciative of it. It's helpful. I'm very appreciative when somebody can quote Ellen White and quote the book, the page, the paragraph. Very appreciative. But I now know hmm, that doesn't mean you're a man of God. You, just because you can quote your brains out, that does not mean that you are a man of God. And when people tell me that, Brother Lemon, I know that you're a man of God. I challenged them. I said, how do you know? They said, because you preach so powerfully. Da, da, da. I said, sister, the devil could preach. I, no, and I let them know that. I said, listen, the devil could preach. I said, don't, don't, don't conclude that I'm a man of God. You got to hang out with me. I said, you got to hang out with me. You got you to watch me. Watch me in my home. Watch me when I'm out amongst the crowds. Watch me when I'm off the pulpit. Pay double attention to me when I'm off the pulpit. And after hanging out with me for a little while, if you can still say, okay, you're a man of God, maybe your words are a little more trustworthy. But I said, but don't conclude that I'm a man of God just because I can preach well. And devils can do that, unfortunately. Oh, very unfortunately. Devils can do that. It's very sad. Very sad. And so we need to understand that even when people can quote all this stuff and everything else, that's great, but that doesn't mean they're right. That doesn't mean they're right. You got to be a Berean. You got to listen to them and you got to put good methods of study together and you got to say, okay, I heard you. I heard everything you said. Now, me and Jesus are going to have a talk and we will come to our conclusion. As my mentor says, and I didn't forget your question, as my mentor says, I go to men for information, but I go to God for advice. And it's like, advice is when you tell me what to do. I'll go to you for information. Hey, do you have some info on this? I'm about to make a decision. Do you have some info on this? I'm about to make a decision. But then I take all of the information. I say, all right, Lord, I have all the information. Now what do you want me to do? And then me and God make the final decision. You follow that? Go to men for information, but go to God for advice. Go ahead, Brother Siraj. What do you uh, have? I just wanted to say that uh, when Brother Andrew was talking about forgiveness, unless you have um, mercy in your heart, you will not even forgive. Yeah. So God said love is to keep his commandments, but above his commandments, he put his mercy seat. Yeah. And so that's why 
having a merciful heart is the absolute correct way to be perfect in the sight of God. Oh, yes, absolutely. Amen. Praise God, brother. Thank you so much for that comment. You know, family, I think we had a wonderful time in our Sabbath school. Um, I know I did. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. You teach this so much. But I still, I, I have so much joy in doing this. I mean, it, it's just beautiful. It's beautiful to see people. And I'll be honest with you, in this day and age, with so many people mocking God, mocking the Bible, mocking his truth, it's refreshing to be in an environment where people still love God. They still want to follow him, and they still believe his truth. Jesus said in Luke 18, 8, when the Son of Man comes, will I even find faith on the earth? Will I find people who trust the word only? My hope and my prayer is that we will put our trust in God. In fact, that's the, that's the um, oh, well, we did this already. Whoa, now we're not doing him. Here, look at this as close. The study of the Bible demands our most diligent effort and persevering thought. Don't forget that. The study of the Bible demands our most diligent effort and persevering thought. As the miner digs for the golden treasure in the earth, so earnestly, persistently must we seek for the treasure of God's word. In daily study, look at this, the what by what? The verse by verse method is often most helpful. Did we do verse by verse today? Amen. It says, in daily study, the verse-by-verse -verse method is often most helpful. Let the student take one verse and concentrate the mind on ascertaining the thought that God has put into that verse for him. And then dwell upon the thought until it becomes his own. One passage thus studied until its significance is clear is of more value than the perusal of many chapters with no definite purpose in view and no positive instruction gained. This is how we study the Bible. And my hope and my prayer is that you will continue this. Form groups some of you come together, meet according to the schedules that you have, and say, let's do that again. Let's go verse by verse, and let's look at these various things that we believe, and let's ask ourselves. I want you to ask yourself. I had to ask myself, Dwayne, how many times have you put the application in front of the interpretation? And I think that if you ask yourself the same question, you might discover some things about your study life that needs improvement, and you will be amazed and how much more will come out of the verses as a result of just going verse by verse and just say what the text says and stick to what the text says and see how God is revealing himself to us. Remember the three questions that you are to ask yourself at the end of every study. What was the lesson talking about? That was question number one. What was the lesson talking about? Question number two. What does this have to do with me? I just studied this whole lesson. God, what are you saying to me? Because all of these things we read in the Bible was not just for the patriarchs, the prophets, and the apostles of old. It's for God's people today. Second question, what does this have to do with me? Third question, and in my opinion, the most important question, what did I learn about God's character? What did I learn about God's character through this reading? And the more that you do that, family, you're going to find that more and more love for Jesus is going to be produced. And that's what secures us for the kingdom. That's what makes us safe in heaven. And you will find that you and Jesus will have such a oneness that like the woman at the well, you cannot keep your mouth shut. You will go and you will tell the world. If that's your desire to have such a union with Christ, that we will say, oh, Lord, come into my heart that I might go and tell the world and tell them about this one that I have finally found. I finally found a real man, and his name is Jesus. If it's your desire to go ahead and communicate that love, to receive that love, and to make known that love to others, let's stand to our feet. Let's have a word of prayer, close out our study time. Thank the Lord for our Sabbath school. Thank you so much for allowing, us, allowing me to uh, speak for the Sabbath school, and I pray that your hearts have been uplifted and blessed. Let's pray together. Father in heaven. Lord, we praise you. We thank you so much. What a privilege, Father. We can read these words and understand them. 
And Lord, the world needs this. They need it so bad. There's a false version of Christianity that's being presented. And Lord, you have this masterful ability to take that which is false, present the truth, and it makes people free. Lord, please, do it first in our own heart. Remove the false. Remove the interpretations and applications that were foul and help us, Lord God, to come to faithful interpretations that leads to faithful applications and then help us to go and tell the world. Bless us to this end, I pray. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen. 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 Look forward to seeing you all at the 11 o'clock hour. Oh, definitely. All right, happy Sabbath. Uh, Praise the Lord for that Bible study session. So we're going to talk about some uh, the brain health today. We're going to continue with um, what we've been talking about, the health of the mind and also health of the brain. And as always, I'd like to open a scripture for my presentations. And my scripture for this presentation is... 3 John, verse 2. It says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. 
And this talks about, obviously, physical health and spiritual health. So let's talk about the physical first, and we'll talk more about the spiritual in 10 minutes. Um, everyone has a brain, I hope. Um, but the brain is a very important, vital organ. And the brain, there's some stats, the brain weighs about three pounds. Again, your brain storage capacity is considered virtually unlimited, which means that you have no excuse not to memorize things or no excuse to say, my brain only works at its capacity of 10%. The human brain can generate about 23 watts of power, enough to power a light bulb. Something so powerful, yet it, power, it, it, it conserves energy. So very efficient in the way that it does its work. The most powerful supercomputers takes an entire building just to run that thing. But the brain just powers 23 watts and does so many specialized um, functions. A piece of the brain tissue the size of a grain of sand contains about 100,000 neurons and 1 billion synapses. It says that the, the brain contains 10% of neurons. And these neurons number 86 billion neurons. And that's the, size, the, the same amount of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God is showing how nature is mimicking. He, he creates our, the nature, but also our brains and our bodies. Your brain isn't fully formed until you're 25, the age 25. Your brain actually develops from the back and works its way to the front. So your frontal lobe, which controls all your your behaviors, your emotions, your thoughts actually develops last. So, you, you know, the, the going, the saying is that you can make your decisions when you're 16 years old to become a boy or a girl or whatever you want to do. Yet, your brain isn't fully developed until you're 25. But the brain does so many different things. Um, the frontal lobe, obviously, is for motor control, the parietal lobe for touch and sensation, the occipital lobe for sight, Cerebellum for balance, how you play the piano, for instance, or shoot a basketball. Uh, brain stems for involuntary, pro involuntary processes like your heart rate or um, your breathing as well, from your, your, uh, your brain stem. A temporal lobe for auditory or hearing, and also your language processing as well. And we have maps about the brain and how the brain um, does different things. For instance, the frontal lobe, again, of attention, planning, decision-making, this speech also comes from the frontal lobe, um, hearing from the temporal lobe, vision from the occipital lobe, so forth and so on. We have maps that dictates what happens and where it happens in the brain. But obviously, we, we live in a world that's fallen, and we have diseases that affects the brain. Um, Alzheimer's diseases, Parkinson's disease, uh, multiple sclerosis, seizures, autism, ALS, these are all things that can affect our brain health. And in turn, it affects our physical health overall, the, the health of the entire body. For instance, Alzheimer's, it's, it's said that the, the most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's dementia, and it affects more than 5 million adults in the US alone, and more than 55 million adults worldwide. Around 1 million people in the US have Parkinson's disease, with further 90,000 cases diagnosed each year. It's not getting better. It's actually getting worse. Um, you probably heard of um, Bruce Willis, for instance, with frontotemporal dementia, or um, Wendy Williams, frontotemporal dementia as well. So these things are getting worse, and it's affecting those around us more so than before. But simple things like nutrition, are ways that we can stave off dementia and all other brain type issues, diseases. And did you know that you have a second brain? Yeah, the gut. Actually, the, we're finding out that the gut actually communicates with the brain. A lot of studies have shown that what we eat impacts our brains and how we think, but also how, how we move as well. One study showed that this was from 2000 and 21, I believe, it says, 
This is from a study from Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. It says a new study in mice has identified a previously undescribed type of astrocyte, which the researchers say may actually protect against inflammation. The study has also revealed that the newly identified astrocyte type receives signals from gut bacteria, which appears to boost its anti-inflammatory activity. So what you eat affects the gut bacteria, and the gut bacteria controls or communicates with the brain. And if the brain is not telling the, the, gut, the astrocyte to fight inflammation, then you can develop things like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or even cancers. We're finding this out now, and God has told us this from the very beginning of time. What you eat can affect your thinking, but also your overall life. So things that you can eat, uh, a bowl of broccoli, for instance, is very high in alpha-lipoic acids. We'll talk more about that and fats in the brain. High in vitamin Cs. It's also high in vitamin K. You don't need to take a tablet or a capsule for vitamin K. Just eat your broccoli. Blueberries. Blueberries are very good. It's high in antioxidants, very good for um, brain cells, and also communicating between the brain cells. It says that the brain cells can um, communicate with each, with each other at a speed of 250 miles per hour, very fast. Some individuals can probably do, do are slower than that, but it's, they can be very fast in the way that they communicate with each other. Things that you can do is make smoothies, uh, berry smoothies, blueberry smoothies, strawberry smoothies, these things that you can, you can make on a daily basis to help with your brain health. You can add ginger to it. Ginger is very good for inflammation. Um, it's, it contains gingerols. It's also antioxidants, um, has antioxidant properties as well. Turmeric, turmeric is also good. It's ginger's cousin. It has anti-inflammatory properties, antioxidant compounds as well, like curcumin. And who knows what this is? It's not your brain? Are you sure? Yeah, it's actually a walnut, and walnuts are very good for your brain for many reasons. One, it has omega-3 fatty acids. You, did you know that your brain is the fattiest organ in your body? 60% of your brain is fat. Ah, I'm getting to that. You're stealing my thunder. Um, <laughs> But also flax seeds. Flax seeds are very good for uh, these omega-3 fatty acids, alpha-lipoic acid, anti-inflammatory as well, antioxidants. And also, your brain is, okay, 60% fat, but it also makes its own cholesterol. Uh, so like she was saying, about 25% of your body's cholesterol resides in your brain. Your brain makes its own cholesterol, and the brain cannot receive the cholesterol from the body. So it makes its own. But however, when you take your statins, if you take statins, it can cross the blood-brain barrier and disrupt your brain's production of cholesterol. And that's why some individuals can get things like Alzheimer's, dementia, and other brain issues because of that. So yes, sir. Um, so you put up omega-3s earlier. Right. And both of them reference ALA. But you're hearing a lot about EPA, DHA. Is that in your presentation at all? No. Well, there's omega-6, omega-3s, omega-6, omega-9s. Uh, it's not in my presentation, but I can talk to you individually. Other things that are good for your brain health, fava bean sprouts, Brussels sprouts, pistachios, tomatoes, high in lycopene. Lycopene is very good for the brain. Avocados, again, the fats, carrots, uh, vitamin A and vitamin C, spinach, beets, tofu as well. Siberian ginseng, herbs for the brain, jogulin, vervain, rhodiola, valerian root, um, but also things, there's, there's, you know there's a tree on the campus, right? Yes. So pick some and you, know, you can take them home. Ginkgo biloba, it increases blood flow to the brain. It also improves memory. Who needs help with that? So pick some today. Go, go, up, go up to the lifestyle center and pick some today. Improves cognitive... <laughs> Improves cognitive function and ability. 
Bukopa Monieri. Bukopa Monieri is called the water lily. It's good for memory, insomnia, anxiety, and stress, et cetera. It's also good for increasing blood flow to the brain, decreases amyloid production, which is the, the supposed cause of dementia, Alzheimer's dementia. Also, arrests or improves Parkinsonian symptoms. Macuna purins, who's ever heard of this one? It's a broad bean. It's, it's actually found to be a natural form of levodopa, and it's very good for um, individuals with Parkinson's. Clinical effects of high dose um, macuna purins were similar to levodopa alone at the same dose with a more favorable tolerable, tolerability profile. So basically, no side effects. Desire of Ages, page 8, 822, says God often uses the simplest means to accomplish the greatest results. Simple means. Simple means like exercise as well can actually help with your brain health. Studies are finding that exercise, studies are showing that, not, that exercise can not only reduce the risk of neurodegenerative diseases such as dementia and Parkinson's, but it might also slow the progress of these diseases after diagnosis. Simple things like walking. Going outside and walking after a meal, for instance, is very important. Chair exercises, and there's no excuses. If, you, if you're chair bound, you can exercise in the chair. Or learn something new. Learn a new scripture every day. Or knit. I don't like knitting, but you, if you like that, that's up to you. Things like water. Uh, water is very important for the brain as well. Um, the brain tissue uh, is made up about, of about 75% of water. So imagine if I'm dehydrated. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll get that. It, fat also draws water. Um, but water is very important uh, for the brain, and you can have, actually have dementia-type symptoms if you are dehydrated. Rest is also important. And daily rest is very important. You know, take a five. No one takes a break anymore. No one takes 15 minutes anymore for a break. And you can take that break with God throughout your day. And sleep is also important. Um, it's shown that sleep deprivation actually kills brain cells. So sleep. Get your seven to eight hours of sleep every night. That is very important. And last but not least, your thoughts. Mental rest is also important. It says the average person has about 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day. Of those, 95% are exactly the same repetitive thoughts as the day before, and about 80% are negative. I want to ask a question, how many negative thoughts does God have? None. So we should have, we should have these thoughts that God has, and none of our thoughts should be negative throughout the day. And negative thoughts can actually lead to Alzheimer's, dementia, stress, for instance. Our stressors can lead to these issues. If you're constantly, repetitively thinking about these things, it leads to dementia. Last but not least, trust in God. And this is the glue to everything. Pray without ceasing is how we trust in God. Every day, every hour, if you need. Uh, Psalm 71 verse 9 says, Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. And God can protect you even from these diseases if you pray to him daily. But also it starts when you're young. So even now, um, those who are 88 and, or 8, you can start praying to him today for good brain health. And last but not least, do not forsake the gathering. When we forsake the gathering, we don't have that social bond with each other that actually helps to stimulate good mental and physical health of the brain. My closing scripture is taken from Romans 12, verse 2. It says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The brain is not the mind. The brain is actually a receptacle of the mind. And God says we should renew our minds daily. And if we renew our minds daily, we can renew our body, the brain, daily as well. So I hope that you're blessed by this and you have some tools to have effective and efficient brain health. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Uchipines Church. The first thing we need to do is 
make sure that we're friendly with the people next to us. Let's press in, press together. We are going to be full to overflowing today, and we'd like to have every seat available. Uh, anybody who's not shy, there's seats on the front still right here. Um, we are not a normal North American church. Normally, they say if you're 80% full, you're more than full. And we're going to be more than 80% full. We are already more than 80% full, so thank the Lord for that. Amen. Welcome this morning. Um, the Bible marking class that w was supposed to start this morning was um, deferred till next Sabbath. So take note of that, and it'll be in classroom number three next, starting next Sabbath. We will have a fellowship meal after the service. And if you are here for the seminar, or if you're a trainee or a work-study student, they're looking for you at the Lifestyle Center kitchen dining hall. I guess it's the proper word. And the rest of us will enjoy the, the uh, lunch here. Please join us if you don't have a place already. Uh, there will be a special prayer service here at 2.30 this afternoon. This has been going on for many years. We prayed this church into existence, and now we're praying the debt away. And God is blessing those prayers. If you look at your numbers there, we're down to 181, 170. Hallelujah. The Improving Health Seminar will continue this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Okay, so you can come here to have prayer, and we'll be done at 3 o'clock, and you can go to the, to the meetings that will be over in, in the chapel this afternoon. Um, we have a membership transfer today. Second reading, Sister Lena Greaves from the Farmville SCA Church in... Farmville, Virginia, right? Would like to join us, and this is our second reading. What is your pleasure? We have a motion. Is there a second? All in favor? Tell her we love her, and we'll make her stand next week, okay? She'll be home next, next Sabbath. Next Sabbath is a high day again. We have the Religious Liberty Director of the or associate director of the Southern Union will be here speaking on religious liberty, and there will be a 3 o'clock p.m. question and answer time. That's a big day, so please plan to be here the 21st, which is a week from tomorrow, spring cleaning at the Uchi Pines Church. Spring cleaning at the Uchi Pines Church. If you have an hour, Give us an hour. Give God an hour. And if you have more, uh, there'll be plenty to do. What time? Nine to twelve. So we only want three hours. So one hour is one third of that. So it would be very helpful. I'll be praying for you from Country Life. <laughs> Take our cell phones and make sure they're on silent so we can have a uninterrupted service to the Lord and let's prepare our hearts now for the divine worship service.
Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for blessing us all to make it safely through another week. We're grateful for the privilege to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for the freedom that we have to worship you, knowing that these days are numbered. And I pray, Lord, help us to have a fresh experience as we once again commune with heaven and thankfully heaven with us. Abide with us now, we pray, and thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning again. Let's stand as we sing our opening hymn, number 590, 590.
seated, please. Trust and obey. It's the only way to be happy in Jesus. To be happy in Jesus is to trust and obey, by the way. It works both, both ways. It's time for testimonies. I'm going to limit the testimonies to three. Please make them short so that we can hear what Brother Lemon has to speak. One right up here. Pastor Hargraves. Go ahead, Sister Christine. I um been praying for a, a couple of friends of mine that their house would sell. They're they're getting older and he's um he's got dementia and so I really been praying and praying for them. And so yesterday morning I said, Lord, could you please sell their house today? And then I thought, well, it's Friday. I said, but maybe you could still sell it today. <laughs> she called me yesterday in the house sold. Wow. I'm sorry. Amen. It, just, it was so thrilling. It was so Amen. thrilling. And I praise God for the attendees to the seminar and the herb class and how wonderful he is through all of it. Amen. Amen. I thank the Lord that the fruition is here. The Great Controversy MAGA book, and it is a mega book. <laughs> anyway, this is what we're planning to print in Africa, and we have one in the library, so if you'd like to look at it, uh, they're available. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, I just want to praise God that I made it to my guitar lesson yesterday because I didn't know how I was going to make it, and so I'm thankful, and it went really well, so I'm really happy. Amen. Amen. We're getting ready to have the morning prayer, but before we do, you need to be aware that the offering will be right after the morning prayer, and it's for the Hope Channel International. And we will sing the prayer response after the prayer this morning. It's in your bulletin. That's probably the easiest place to find it, or if you don't have a bulletin, number six. Second. 668, O Thou Who Hearest. Let's bow in, in prayer as far as possible this morning. Thank you. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you for your bountiful, bountiful blessings. Thank you for the rain that came earlier this week. Thank you for the sunshine. May the sunshine of your love shine in this place today. May the Holy Spirit fill this place, fill each one. We ask in a special way that you will lay your anointing on Brother Lemon as he is to break the bread of life this morning. And we just ask that we will hear what you have and we will apply it in our lives. Please come and bless this service in a special way, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Got to pray for the offering. Let's bow our heads. Father, please bless your ties and our free will gifts to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. It is time for our special music. I'm not sure who's in charge of our special music. So the children's choir is coming. We're ready for you. Oh 
when there's no peace on earth, there is peace in Christ. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Well, let the church say amen again. Amen. I mean, that is just beautiful. That was just beautiful. Praise God. Praise God. Very quickly, I want to give just a couple of announcements. Um, the first thing I want to remind us about is that this evening's, the last message, um, I had a couple of personal requests, and um, I took it to heart and prayed and thought about it. And uh, I have decided that I'll go ahead and share my testimony this evening. And so for this evening, that will be our final presentation, is uh, just to give my testimony of how God brought me into this wonderful movement and the wonderful light of his grace, love, and power. And so that will be our final message this evening. Five o'clock, we will have some time for question and answer. We know that a lot has been shared since I had the privilege of being here with you all from Wednesday night up until now. And so if there are any questions that you have on your heart that you would like to go ahead and ask, I will be here and you can go ahead and ask your questions. If uh, questions have been written down, then I need those. But if you haven't written them down, don't worry about it. You can go ahead and ask. The Bible promises that the Spirit of God will bring to our remembrance what's needed. So I'll trust him for that. But in either case, we can do our Q&A at 5 o'clock, and I look forward to seeing you. I'm assuming, is this he, is, will the Q&A be here, or it's going to be, okay, it's going to be at the chapel. All right. And the final presentation will be at the chapel as well. At the end of the final presentation, um, I'm also going to be sharing a little bit, because sometimes individuals inquire. Uh, my family and I, we are, my wife and I, we are a self-supporting ministry. We've been, uh, we've been in self-supporting ministry for over 15 years. And we're going to talk a little bit about if your heart is inclined to support the ministry, there are ways that you can do that, and it will not be collecting an offering. So you'll understand that better when we come together this evening. Nevertheless, we are at the final question. We are at the final question. All this week, we've been looking at the questions of Jesus. And we have found that Christ had some pretty profound questions. We saw on night number one that Jesus was asking the question, who do you say that I am? And then the next question came up in the morning where Jesus asked us, what do you want me to do for you? Did you hear that testimony? Did you, did you see how my sister was very, very specific. And she asked for something special. She said, Lord, this is what I want you to do, not for me, but for someone else. I'm asking you to sell their house, knowing that the Sabbath will be here, but you can do anything, Lord. And it was as it were, Jesus was asking you, what do you want me to do? And you told him what you wanted him to do. And look at how gracious our God was. And he did it. And if God will do it for our dear sister and these lovely people, and because he's no respecter of persons, tell God what you want him to do for you. But then we saw that Jesus said, the next question was, do you believe that I can do this? Do you believe that I can do this? That was the next question. And then after that, Jesus asked another question, which was, have you not read? And we learned about the principles of studying the word of God and reading. And after that, Jesus asked us another question last night, which was, couldn't you watch with me just for one hour? 
Couldn't you just watch with me just for one hour? In this morning's subject, the closing question that I think is very appropriate, Jesus asks, do you love me? That's Jesus' question to us this morning. That's the title of our message. Do you love me? And so as we prepare to receive once again the dew from heaven, as we prepare our hearts to receive the word, I'm going to do as has been my custom and our custom, and I'm going to kneel for a word of prayer. And if you're able to, I'd like to invite you to kneel with me. And if you can't kneel, just bow your head where you are. But if you can kneel, let's kneel together. And let's pray. And let's ask God to prepare our hearts to receive his word. Father in heaven, Lord, you've been very gracious to us all throughout this week. You've blessed us not only in these meetings that I, your servant, have been privileged to do, but all these other wonderful meetings, learning so much about the body, truly resonating with your son David, who said, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and marvelous are thy works. I thank you for every precious soul that has been involved in making this week such an incredible blessing for us. And Lord, we are coming to you once again because there's still more about Jesus we would learn. And so I just pray in the name of Jesus, please help us. Help us, Lord God, to realize how much you love us, but to realize that you loved us. And part of the reason for that love is to better help us to love you. Teach us how to do it, I pray. Give us wisdom that exceeds our years. Give us, we pray of our sins, Lord, and Lift our hearts heavenward. But this is our prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. You're going to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. The Bible lets us know that Jesus was intimately acquainted with his disciples. He knew them better than they knew themselves. I think about that with my children. I have children that are all young adults. And they all like to tell dad how much they know. And sometimes they tell me all sorts of things. They try to teach me. They try to school me. And help me understand life. <laughs> and sometimes I'm listening to what they're saying like, thank you, Lord. This is, you're answering my prayer when I asked you to help me be more patient. <laughs> so there are times that I would just let them teach me about life. And there was a lot of times my children were reminded, um, Dad knows us better than we know ourselves. And how much the more Jesus, when he looks at all of us, his little children. And Jesus is consulting and talking with his disciples heart to heart. One of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, though they might forsake you, he says, not me. And Jesus looked at his lovely child, and he says, you don't even know that before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. Peter, of course, began to deny him and to correct him. But because Jesus is the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, Gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. Jesus just listens to him. He says, okay. Time progresses, and as a result of time progressing, Peter evidently forgot all about that conversation. And he goes through the trial of his life as he watches his beloved Savior get taken away from him. You know, Peter's love was imperfect. 
but he did love Jesus. And I find that, you know, I, I used to think to myself, Lord, you know, I, I, I just did something wrong. I guess that means I don't love you. And Jesus would say, no, it's not that you don't love me, but my love has not yet been perfected in you, Dwayne. And I want to let you know that because there's some people in life that are so arrogant that sometimes you have to remind them of how erring and faulty they really are. There's some people that need those reminders. But I realize the devil has a, you know, again, he's the master trapper. When, when the devil sets one trap here and you say trap and then you run, pow, he set up another trap here. He's a master trapper. And while it is true that there are some people that are so arrogant in their walk with God, that they have to be reminded at times of how frail and how weak, and how unreliable their hearts are. And they must humble themselves before the sight of the Lord. There's another group of people that are keenly aware of how undone they are. And because they're so aware of their undone condition, the devil takes them to an extreme. He helps them see clear as day how messed up they are, and they begin to think, I'm so messed up, I don't even know if the grace of God could save me. And so sometimes those individuals need to be reminded, yes, you may be imperfect, but you have not been cast off. There are some of you that might hear the voice of Satan sometimes saying, see, you don't love God. Look at what you just did. You know what Jesus says? Jesus says, listen, that's not totally true. You do love me. Jesus says, I, I know your life. I know it better than anybody else. And Christ says, I know you love me. But I need you to cooperate with me so you can let me show you how you can love me perfectly. Peter loved Jesus. He loved him. But it was a very imperfect love. And Jesus knew this brother needs a lesson. He needs to understand. Jesus loved him so much that he told him the truth. That's what real friends and that's what family does. You're not my friend and you're not my family when you see that I'm clearly messing up and you're going to tell me I'm doing all right when you know I'm not doing right. That's not love. That's not family. Jesus told him, I heard you, Peter. I understand you think you're going to stand for me, but I'm telling you because I love you. He's like, I'm telling you, before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. Well, the final time came where Peter is asked the questions, and I would imagine we all know the story. Peter, of course, denies Jesus three times. And one of the things I like is how, how his face locks with Jesus after that denial. And his face locks in on Jesus. And we've been talking about the book Desire of Ages throughout this week. I don't know if you've ever read Desire of Ages commentary where it says that when Jesus was looking at him, she says, there was no anger there. Boy, do we need to learn how to be like him. There's only one thing worse than when I told you. There's only one thing worse than, when, than doing wrong is when I warned you that you were about to do the wrong, and then you fell into it anyhow. There's something about our human nature that when somebody falls after you warned them and told them, hey, if you do this, you're going to fall, there's something in our human nature that says, you know, when they fall, we kind of look at them like, didn't I tell you? You know, we kind of have that look. We kind of have that attitude. But here goes Jesus. No irritation, no agitation, no anger in his face, not even in his face. I said, Lord, you got to teach me how to do that. But Peter did something that was a very, very gross mistake. He did not deny Christ privately. He denied Christ publicly. And private sin requires private confession. But public sin requires public confession. So Peter is fishing. He's kind of 
is trying to collaborate and get his thoughts together. He has gone through absolute turmoil. But the word came out that Jesus has risen. And Jesus finally gets a chance to reconnect with Peter. And the Bible says in John 21, and if you're there, just let me know by saying amen. Amen. Jesus says to Peter, as he's getting ready to reinstate him, as it were, into his ministerial calling. But Jesus already told him, when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. The Bible says in John 21, starting at verse 15, so when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me? But he didn't just ask that. It's almost like Jesus was giving him that flashback. Because remember, after Jesus said, I'm telling you that you all will deny me and forsake me, Peter was like, they might deny you. They might forsake you. Not me. So here comes Jesus coming along, and Jesus says to him, Peter, lovest thou me? More than these? Peter's in a different mindset now. The Bible says, and we continue in the verse, he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Well, then feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Verse 16, he saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. Verse 17, he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. You denied me three times, you must confess me three times. And so Peter now has confessed, and that's why, and Jesus is doing it in front of the disciples. He's doing it in front of the others because he wants to make sure you all are a witness that as he denied me three times, he is now confessing me three times. And I am clearly showing that I approve of his confession for every time I said, now go and feed my sheep. Jesus wants us to understand The great qualifier of the work that he has called us to do, do you love me? Do you love me? What makes evangelism so scary today is there's a lot of people who are ministering and preaching and teaching about God, but they don't necessarily love him. That's a very concerning thing. And this is why Jesus wanted us, when, he, when, when we look at this story, I thought to myself, I said, what a powerful statement here. It says, at the last meeting of Christ with his disciples by the sea, Peter tested by the thrice repeated question, lovest thou me, had been restored to his place among the twelve. You see, Peter disassociated himself from Christ when he denied him. So now Jesus wants to reinstate him. He wants to bring him back into his place, his right position. But Jesus had to ask these questions. Now watch. It says, his work had been appointed him. He was to feed the Lord's flock. Now, what's that word? Converted. Praise God. Now converted and accepted. He was not only to seek to save those without the fold, but was to be a shepherd of the sheep. We have to understand that the work that God has given us to do is a dual work. It is not a singular work. We are called to ministers to those without, and we are called to minister to those within. Go to the book of James chapter 5. I want you to see this. In James, the fifth chapter, the Bible brings out a point that we would do well to consider. James, we're going to chapter 5, and I want you to watch how the text goes. These verses are true whether someone is in the church or out of the church. These verses are still the truth because we have to understand that there are people in the church and out of the church that are in the same condition. The Bible says in James chapter 5, considering verse 19, it says, Brethren, 
If any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. These verses apply to those inside the church as well as to those outside the church. And we know it to be true because the verse said in verse 19, they err from the truth, which means that at one point they had it. That's not necessarily describing the worldling. The worldling doesn't even have it. So soul winning and soul saving is not just something you do once or twice a year when you go outside the church on some campaign. Soul saving and soul winning is something that we do all the time when we mingle with brethren because for those of us who have discernment, we know that there are some that are even in the church that are still in a lost condition. It's just the truth. And God wants us to understand that, that every time I come to church, oh Lord, please give me your spirit, help me to have discernment. Because there are people that I can talk to. Brothers and sisters, I've, I've, I've been invited to church by pastors just to discover the pastor was unconverted. And it wasn't, it wasn't something where it was, it was like a, a shaming situation. It's just when, when, you, when you show yourself friendly, you gain friends. And oh yeah, there was a time, man, I used to come to churches and I would blow up the church. Blow the church up. It was like I would take my spiritual bomb and just, and just blow up the church. And then I'd leave the pastor to go clean up the mess. I thought I was doing my job. I thought I was being a so-called John the Baptist. And God was bringing it clear to my heart, Dwayne, you are bringing shame to my name. You are not representing me. It's easy for anybody to come into town, make a whole bunch of folks feel like wicked law sinners, and tell them, think about it, and then leave. That's an easy thing to do. But as the Lord began to convert my heart, and I began to understand that even pastors and ministers deserve compassion too. Their souls are people that Jesus died for. One minute Peter was denying Christ. One minute Peter was even filled with Satan and saying things to Jesus that Jesus had to say, get thee behind me, Satan. But that's the same Peter who led out under the early reign. When you read Acts chapter 6, I love it. In Acts chapter 6, it's before chapter 7. Well, I know that's obvious, but here's the point. <laughs> In Acts chapter 7, that marks the close of probation on the Jewish nation. Okay? Acts chapter 7. That marks the closing of it. That's the transition moving from the Jewish nation. Now, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Right? Acts chapter 6, meaning right before the close of probation. You know what Acts 6 says? It's so beautiful, I want you to see it. Go to Acts chapter 6. I want you to see it for yourself. In Acts chapter 6, the Bible says in Acts the 6th chapter, I want you to watch it. See it for yourself, family. Right before. This is, keep in mind, this is right before the close of probation. What does the Bible say in Acts chapter 6? It says in Acts 6, as a result of some deacons who were under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says in Acts chapter 6 in verse 7, it says, and the word of God, what? Increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and I love the close of this verse. What does it say? And a what kind of company? A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. That tells me that these same priests, many of them that were amongst the crowd, crucify him. These same individuals that hated Jesus and was against the present truth, the presence of the truth was right in front of them. These priests thought they were on the side of God and they were part and parcel of the condemnation of Jesus Christ. And here it is that some of these individuals later on were counted amongst this number 
and they became obedient to the faith. As it was in the times past, so shall it be in the future. There are some ministers right now that are against the present truth. There are some people right now that are fighting the progress of God's work. But Jesus says through faithful and proper ministry, there are many of these individuals, I wish it were all, but there are many of these individuals that as a result of the faithful labor of even the lay people, the Bible is showing us that many of them are going to be converted right at the 11th hour. And that's why it is so tragic, it is so demonic when we decide to take a camera like a coward you are and to begin to make a ministry blasting the leadership. Any weakling and any coward can do that. It doesn't take strength and it doesn't take courage. That's not the attitude of God's people in the last days. Oh, yes, we have to confront. But for me, I believe a real man is somebody who calls a brother up, emails the brother, does something to reach out to some of these people and say, listen, what's going on? These things are erroneous that you're teaching. Can we talk? Can we reason together? Now, brothers and sisters, I did this with some of these ministers. They were against God. They were against the truth. They said, I'll die before I'll let another one of these present truth preachers come on my pulpit. They were wrong for so many reasons. But through patient labor, through loving in spite of, And through finding ways to show yourself friendly, I have seen with my own eyes unconverted ministers who became converted and are doing wonderful things for the Lord. They're standing for the truth for this time. Jesus says, when I say feed my sheep, he's saying it not just to Peter. He's saying it to you. He's saying it to me. He's saying, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And understand, the lambs and the sheep are not just those outside the fold, but it's a lot of people inside the fold. And our human nature needs no training to learn how to talk behind people's backs. Did you? I hope you caught what I said. I hope you caught it. Our human nature needs no training to know how to talk behind people's back and slander each other. Our human nature needs no training. We do that easily, and we do that quite naturally. But it's supernatural. It's very supernatural from the heart to be able to say, you know that minister and these people right over here, you know, they're going going in paths that's going to be destructive to themselves and to the people of God. Let's first pray for them. Let's see if we can pray with them, and then let's go ahead and let's see if we can try to correct the situation before it gets out of hand. Now, am I saying that there's not a time and a place, as Timothy tells us, that sometimes you have to rebuke the elders before all? Sure there is. But it's typically after the elder has already known that there's been some issues going on and that you have on record the efforts to try to correct the situation before it went public. God is a God of order. God wants us to understand the feeding of the sheep is not just those within, it's not just those without. But then let's do the vice versa of this. Go to John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, we have another balance to this point. In John chapter 10, The Bible is very clear. Jesus made it very clear. Do you love me? Oh, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, okay, the fruit, the fruit of your love is that you will feed my sheep. Jesus is making that very clear. If you really love me, the fruit of your love is that you will feed my sheep. That's the fruit, okay? Now, we just addressed the fact that sheep can apply to those in the church. Don't bypass the brethren. Don't think that soul winning is just, again, something we do outside and all of these things. Soul winning is something we do within. 
There are people right next to us. There are people that we see every single week that's in a lost condition. Sadly, concerningly, but nevertheless true, there are some people that are right next to us in our bed who's a lost sheep. If a husband, if a wife is willing to be honest, sometimes the lost sheep is called wife. The lost sheep is called husband. The lost sheep is called son or daughter. The lost sheep is sometimes called mother and father. That's why I'm telling you the number one thing we should all be concerned about is, Lord, where's the true condition of my beloved? What is the true condition? I don't want to make my wife so happy that she begins to feel happy being lost in the presence of her husband who has been called to, law, to win lost sheep. And woe be unto the man that spends all this time ministering to women outside his home and does not minister to the woman inside his home that he has been appointed to. Your wife comes first. She is your first ministry, brothers. Don't be doing all these Bible studies and everything else and got a whole bunch of other women saying amen and thanking God for your ministry. And here it is, your own wife is like, I wish I could get the same attention. I wish I could get the same Bible studies. He sure loves teaching everybody else, but he doesn't spend time teaching me. You want to make sure, first and foremost, the lost sheep are those right within the fold. But John chapter 10, this side of the message needs to be given as well. John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, the Bible says in verse 16, Jesus says, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. There are some who believe that they have been called to minister just inside the church. And almost all of their work that they do is inside. Brothers and sisters, this is an imbalance as well. Peter was largely called, when you read Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2 tells us that Paul was called to win the heathen and Peter was called to win those within. Ah, but there are times you see Peter also winning those without, and there are times you also see Paul winning those within. So there's something called the weight of the work, and then there's the general work. So the general work is we win all souls. We win all sheep. We are those who are called of God to bring all lambs into unity and harmony with Jesus Christ. But then there are going to be times that God will put a weight of the work, and the weight of the work on some will be to work largely with those within. And there'll be the weight of the work on others where the work will be largely without. But we're gifted, talented, and skilled to do work in both areas. You see that with Peter, and you see that with Paul. There are some people that all they do is minister to SDAs. It's one of the greatest traps of the devil, quite honestly. Because if you keep ministering to SDAs all the time, you're going to run out of messages. And what's going to end up happening is you're going to start creating like a, what's that, there was an ice cream. What was that ice cream called with 31 flavors? Baskin Robbins? Was that Baskin Robbins? It's almost like, we begin developing this Baskin-Robin mentality with the three angels' messages. We give the raspberry flavor of the three angels. Then we give the chocolate flavor. And then we give the vanilla flavor. We're still teaching the three angels, but we, we try to add all this flavor to it. And what ends up happening is you start realizing, and I'm serious, I've seen this with the ministries that do this. That's why I, I, there's nothing I say that I don't think about it before I say it. I'm telling you, I've seen this with the ministries. They start ministering to SDA so much that sooner or later, they got to come up with new material. So what do they end up doing? Is they start dabbling and playing around with fanaticism. And next thing you know, they start creeping into time setting. They start saying things that are extra biblical. They start doing stuff and saying stuff because they have to do something to keep the crowd. You start falling into the devil's trap, feeling like you got to come up with new material. 
It's a trap. Jesus makes it very clear. When I said go feed my sheep, that includes those without. It includes those outside of the fold. Now, for those of us who, you know, you know the hard grace, we met each other in the Philippines, and, and listen, it's a beautiful family, lovely family. We had a good time with the Lord, and they know what I'm talking about, amongst, I'm sure, many of us here. Brothers and sisters, isn't it amazing how you could teach the same teaching of the state of the dead? But when you're doing it with sheep outside of the fold, it never gets tired. You, you, you never feel this pressure, I got to come up with new material. You don't feel any of that nonsense. It's the same message, but it's constantly new crowds and new fields. Jesus understood that psychology, and that's one of the reasons why he told us, when you feed sheep, don't just stay within the fold. Don't just stay without the fold. Make sure that you understand you've been called to a dual work. But above all things, Jesus says, but before you go and feed the sheep, make sure you're feeding them good food. And Jesus makes it clear, the qualifier for you to go and feed sheep within, the qualifier for you and I to go to feed sheep without, Jesus says, you must answer in the affirmative, do you love me? The next quote says, Christ mentioned to Peter only one condition of service, lovest thou me? It says, this is the essential qualification. Though Peter might possess every other, yet without the love of Christ, he could not be a faithful shepherd over the flock of God. Knowledge, benevolence, eloquence, zeal, all are essential in the good work. But without the love of Christ in the heart, the work of the Christian minister is a failure. The Bible says that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the eyes of God. Just because people say amen does not mean you're doing your job. What's most important is when you do your work, can I hear with my spiritual hearing, can I hear Jesus saying, amen, son? Even if nobody in the church says amen, that's the amen that counts. And there will be people who do all sorts of strange ministry and will always have a crowd that's going to say amen. And this, this is what keeps certain ministers going. They keep going because they keep developing a crowd that can say amen. But they have to sit back and ask themselves, but is Jesus saying amen? Is heaven saying amen? That's what's most important. The essential ingredient family that is so clear, the one condition of service above all things, do you really love me? Now, the Bible gives us a very clear proof of how we love God, how we show that we love God. And only because there may even be one person in the room that has not read it, I'm going to go ahead and take us there. Anyhow, even though I, I'm sure the great majority of us have read it, it's in John 14. Let's go to John 14. Jesus makes it very clear. Do you love me? He says, look, do you love me? Well, there's proof. There's fruit. In John 14, the Bible's very clear of what the fruit is. In John 14, the Bible says in verse 15, the proof. This is the proof that we love the Lord. In John 14 and verse 15, the Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is the truth. If you love me, keep my commandments. If we love God, we will have no other gods before us. If we love God, we will not erect idols in our lives and bow down to them and worship them. That includes the idol of our own opinions. That includes the idol of the God that we make in our head that does not match the God of the Bible. That's the modern-day idolatry today. There are a lot of people that are bowing down to the image of God they've created in their imagination. 
though it's not the image of God as revealed in Scripture. God says, if you love me, you will not take my name in vain. Right now, largely from one party, even though you can see it in both, in the world of politics, you know, you, how could you ignore what's going on in America right now? Everything is about the elections. There's so much stuff going on right now that speaks to the politics of our land. And we know that there's one side of the, of the politicians that are trying to push forth this Christian nationalism. They're trying to push forth this ideology of making America great again by making America Christian again. And I'm thinking to myself that what in the world is your understanding of Christian? It's okay to lie and still be a Christian. It's okay to cuss and swear like a sailor and still be a Christian. It's okay to commit adultery, to cheat and steal and do all these things and still be a Christian. And it's not just politics. It's in the world that I came from, hip-hop. It seems like there's more and more hip-hop and R&B artists that are coming out. They're gyrating their hips. They're showing forth their nakedness. They're leading people into the very thing that is contrary to the will of God. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3, this is the will of God. Even your sanctification that you might flee from fornication. But the modern-day hip-hop, the modern-day R&B artists, they're encouraging fornication. But do you know what's amazing? It's after they get their award, they come up and they say, I want to thank the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking to myself, what in the world? If there was one brother that I wanted to reach, I was determined to reach that brother coming out of hip-hop. I said, man, I'm determined to reach DMX. I was like, I got to reach that brother. Because what I believe is he was, he was dead serious about his faith in God. He very openly confessed Jesus Christ. But on the same time, in the same vein, that brother's on stage, again, doing all the stuff that I just talked about. But it was like, man, and there was a call porter in our church that caught up with DMX. And he put a picture up of DMX buying the great controversy and all these other things. And I said to myself, I said, well, praise God. I said, you know, I didn't get to reach him myself, but I'm glad somebody did. But what hurt me was how he had a pastor. That was in Christian. But before the IAN, there's C-H-R-I-S-T. We're putting God's name in this term called Christian. But the problem is, is what happens when we call ourselves Christian, but we act so unchrist like We take his name in vain. It's not just limited to the saying God's name before a curse word and these things. Yes, that's true too. But God wants us to understand, don't carry my name and neglect the character that comes with it. God says, if you really love me, you will, re you will remember the Sabbath day, the seventh day, the day that he sanctified, not the day that a man sanctified or a group of men sanctified or some false religion sanctified. We cannot ignore the reality that even many of the Sunday worshiping ministers are telling you, we know that the Sabbath is Saturday. We know that it's Friday sunset to Saturday sunset. I'm like, well, if you know to do good and don't do it, the Bible says that's sin. Why are you not doing it? Well, it's been done away with, just the Sabbath. So all the other nine are intact. And brothers, we've gone through these arguments. Jesus says, if you love me, you will honor your father and your mother even when you turn 18. I don't read anything in the Bible that says, once you're 18, forget this verse. Even when you're 18, even when you're by yourself, you are still my son. You are still my daughter. You're still somebody else's son. You're still somebody else's daughter. And just because you're 18, I read nothing in the Word of God that God says, I now give you a license to do whatever you want. Galatians 5 and verse 13 is very, very clear. God gives us freedom not so we can use it to fulfill our lusts. I mean, it's so clear. But how many young folks read it? Boy, when I turn 18, I'm going to fulfill every lust that I desire. But God says, no, no, you got it wrong. You got it twisted. Jesus says, the fruit of if you love me is you will honor your father and your mother, even if you're 18 or 80. Jesus says, if you love me, 
You will never take the life of another. You will not commit homicide. You will not commit homicide. That's why a police officer can do his duty. And if somebody's about to kill somebody else and they have to take a firearm and take that person down, that police officer is recognizing the scripture as the minister of God. You read Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 4, pay special attention to verse 4. They don't carry the sword in vain. So the appropriate understanding of thou shalt not kill is thou shalt not commit homicide. That's what the text says. God says, if you have love for me, you will not commit homicide. You wouldn't do that. Why would you do that? Why would you end somebody's life unnecessarily for your own purposes, etc.? Mm-mm. No child of God would do that. If you love me, you would keep your eyes on your man and you keep your eyes on your woman and stop wondering and lusting after other people. God makes it very clear. If you love me, he says, you will not commit adultery, not even in your head. This is why watching porn and all this stuff, it's a sin. It's a sin. I understand it's an addiction. I understand it's an entrapment. I understand that most of us growing up, that was probably one of the first introductions to S-E-X that we were exposed to. But Jesus says, you got to understand that whenever I do marriage counseling, I spend three to four weeks just on intimacy. And the reason why is because most of our church, we don't talk about it. We're too conservative. And then what ends up happening is we take our perverted understandings of it and we bring it into the marriage bed. And it's not a wonder that my wife, I, I, I deflect all these sisters to my wife, but I got women that come to me. Brother Lemon, I want to talk about how my husband and I have relations and he makes me feel dirty. And I have to say, sister, I'm sorry to hear that, but I believe this is a conversation that is better handled between a woman and a woman. So please go ahead, and I pass them on to my beloved. I'm like, honey, here you go. And my wife got a line. (laughs) And a lot of them are minister's wives. So I know what I'm saying. Like I told you, I don't say anything just out of the air. I say stuff with data and with proof. There's a lot of us that were educated on SEX. We were educated on it, but we were educated by the world. The church has done a horrible job in talking about what SEX looks like in the eyes of God. The church has done a horrible job of that. We have one book called Testimonies on Sexual Behavior, Marriage, and Divorce. And in the book, it definitely gives some good principles, but there's more that needs to be discussed. There's more that needs to be discussed. And as a result of us doing such a horrible job, I mean, this is like the sin of the age right now. And we're going to not talk about it? That's foolish. That is foolish and unwise. You're not going to talk about it? Are you kidding me? If you don't talk about it, somebody will. Well, here it is. That I'm, I'm just, so what ends up happening is a lot of these individuals did not get any education in this area. And so when we get married, we're bringing what we know into the marriage covenant. The sister doesn't even know right from wrong because, again, it, we've done such a horrible job of talking about it. That she doesn't know what's right or wrong. She loves her man. She wants to please him, so she ends up doing stuff. And sometimes she does stuff even when it violates her own conscience. God says, if you love me, you will not commit adultery. You will not bring that world and defile your marriage bed. God says, you won't do that. Jesus says, if you love me, you won't steal. You won't lie. And you will not lust after things that belong to other people. Jesus says, this is love. You'll keep my commandments. You won't violate them. Now, the question is, how is that love produced? Because it's all right to know what the fruit of love is. If you love Jesus, Jesus says, you'll keep my commandments. You won't do these things. Now, again, I believe we love God. I do believe that. But what's our problem with our love? Our love is to what? Imperfect. It's imperfect. It's imperfect. We, God wants to perfect his love in us, okay? That's what he wants to do. But how does he do it? How does Jesus bring about a love for him that is stronger than life? 
When I read the third angel's message, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. When I read that, these are people that would prefer to die than make one known sin against God. How do you get there? Obviously, there are people that have gotten there. We don't have the book Fox's Book of Martyrs for nothing. That book is written to show that there are human beings that walked on this earth that loved Jesus more than life. Can you imagine John Huss being burnt to death because he wouldn't lie? Literally, the papers said, all you got to do, man, all you have to do is just say you were wrong. That's it. And you know what John Huss's response was? He was such a Christian. You know what that brother's response was? He said, for me to recant... What I have taught would be a lie. His integrity was very much not on earthly plane. His integrity was on a heavenly plane. That man said, for me to recant what I've taught the people, which was the truth, he says that would be a lie. And he said, and I cannot lie. So I'd prefer to burn. You think God's going to let their blood be spilt so we could keep making excuses for our sins? God is too righteous to do that. He's too holy to do that. He would never do that because if that's the case, God would have showed up and said, John, 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 just tell the lie. Don't worry about it. I need you alive. But Jesus was there with John. That's why when those flames were kindling all around him, that brother was singing. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And I could see Jesus with his arms right there, just like those three Hebrew faithfuls. And Jesus was just tapping him, saying, keep singing, John. Keep singing. Fox's Book of Martyrs says he, the only reason he stopped singing was because the fire consumed his tongue where it was physiologically impossible for him to keep singing. Put a match under your hand and try to sing a hymn. In other words, it was a supernatural event. How do you have fire burning your feet, your legs, your chest, your thighs? Your, how do you have feet, fire burning you everywhere and you're still singing? Jesus says, listen, listen, do you love me? He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But the question is how? How do we, how do we develop this love? I naturally hate God. You naturally hate God. We don't just hate God, we hate his ways. That's what Romans teaches us. The carnal mind is at enmity with God. It, it doesn't love God, it doesn't love his law. It hates God and it hates his law. How do we get there, Lord? Two principles. Zechariah chapter 12. Turn to the Bible, watch what it says. Zechariah chapter 12. Lord, how can I get to a place that I could even love you? Zechariah, we're going to chapter 12. Because that's the real question for me is, Lord, I, I'm, I'm willing to love you. I just don't really know how. I don't know how this is going to happen. But God has promised. I'm going to give you two texts of Scripture, one from the old, one from the new. Zechariah chapter 12. The Bible says in Zechariah chapter 12, I love it, verse 10. In Zechariah 12 and verse 10, the Bible says, And I will pour upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication. And then it says, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And what are they going to do? They shall mourn as one mourns for his only son and shall be in bitterness as one who is in bitterness for his firstborn. Jesus says, the more that you behold me, the more, this is why it is so important, especially within this movement that has so much talk about law and commandments. We understand that God wants us to keep his commandments. We understand he wants us to keep his laws of health. We understand these things and we must help the world understand. But Jesus has given us the formula on how to do it. He says, you must behold me. You must look at the one who died that you might live. You must look at the one who embraced your trials so you can overcome your trials. 
You must look at the one who went through your traumas. You're not the only one that was physically and emotionally abused. So was Jesus. You're not the only one that was abandoned. So was Jesus. You're not the only one that was rejected. So was Jesus. You're not the only one that was betrayed. So was Jesus. He said, I'll go even through their traumas so I can show them how they don't have to be overcome by their traumas. Look at the one that after doing all of this for you, you pierced me anyhow. And then in Zechariah 13, in verse 6, it's an amazing story. In Zechariah 13, there's this question that's being asked. I want you to imagine you go to visit a friend, right? You go to visit a friend, knock on their door, ring their doorbell, whatever. You go to your friend to say, hey, how you doing? They say, yeah, come on inside. You come inside their house. And next thing you know, you say, yeah, you know, so, and then all of a sudden, they just jump on you, boom, boom, start beating you up, <clears throat> stomping you on the ground, beating you down. You're thinking to yourself, why are you doing this? And every time you ask why, bow, they just keep hitting you again and again and again. By way of some miracle, you make it out of the house. You get out of the house, you run to your car, and you, 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 you know, you're trying to understand what just happened. You drive home, your family members see you beaten up, battered and bruised. They say to you, what happened? You know how a lot of people would, 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 would respond? A lot of people, maybe not you, maybe not, but I think a lot of people would respond this way. They would say, I went over that loser's house. I went over this horrible person's house and they beat me up. We wouldn't think of them and call them by the same term that we had for them before they did this atrocity to us. But when you read Zechariah 13, when you look at verse 6, there was a question that was asked. And the question was, what are those wounds in your hands? You know how Jesus responds? He says, oh, these here? These are the wounds that I've received in the house of my friends. He still called me his friend. You're my friend, but you hurt me. Why'd you do that to me? Again, when we leave the church, when we make all these moves because of bad people, Jesus looks at us and says, what did I do to you? Why are you leaving me? What did I do to you? Jesus wants us to understand the more that we behold the one in whom we have pierced. For your reading, I want to encourage you to do this. I want you to read something in the volumes. It's volume two of the Testimonies to the Church. I want you to just make this a little private assignment that you do for yourself. It touched my heart. It touched my heart greatly when I did this. I want you to read volume two, 2T, page 200 to 215. I want you to read that. It's a chapter called The Sufferings of Christ. I don't think we pay enough attention to his sufferings. And according to that reading, it tells us that's the case. I want you to, when you, when you get some private time, when I think about the Sabbath day, a beautiful day like this, I get it. There's a lot of stuff going on because of a conference. But if you get a chance to just find a shaded tree, pull a blanket out of something, pull up that volume, pray before you read it. Say, Lord, speak to my heart through this. Read the sufferings of Christ. If we really understood what he went through just so we could have the riches of heaven, inspiration tells us that, number one, it's going to bring conviction. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And it says, and they shall mourn. It will bring on what 2 Corinthians uh, 7, verses 9 and 10, it calls it the godly sorrow. That's what I need. I need more of a godly sorrow for my sins. I don't want a worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is when it's consequence focused. That's worldly sorrow. Oops, I messed up, but as a result of messing up, now the blessing I was going to have, I'm not going to have it anymore. Oh, I'm just mourning. 
That is a worldly sorrow. That's what Judas had. A godly sorrow against thee and thee only have I done this sin and done this evil in your sight. Please forgive me. That's godly sorrow. So the first way that we develop this love for God is you got to constantly, constantly behold the one especially whom you have pierced. This is why we're told in inspiration, a thoughtful hour every day, meditating upon the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. Now, not only this, let me give you the one in the New Testament. Go to Romans 5. Romans 5, because it doesn't just stop there. God doesn't want to just convict us. He wants to do more. So, yes, in Zechariah 12, God is going to definitely, uh, you know, he's going to cause us to behold him. It's going to bring about a true godly sorrow for the sins that we have committed towards him and others. And then Jesus makes it clear that now the next can happen. In Romans 5, the Bible says this, starting at verse 1. In Romans 5 and verse 1, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad or put within us by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. How do I love God? Everything starts with beholding him. And as you behold him, what's going to happen, his promise, especially the one whom we have pierced, it's going to bring about a godly sorrow for our sin because we're going to be in the presence of one who is altogether lovely and we're going to see how altogether ugly we are. It's going to bring a conviction of sin. And as it brings a conviction of sin, we're going to see the grace of God more apparent, more beautiful, more bright, more shining in our face that he is still calling us to his heart. And as we respond to that calling, we receive this justification by faith and we also receive love. It's a miraculous thing. That's why the book Education, page 192, tells us, as the student of the Bible beholds the Redeemer, there is awakened. I like those words. I like words. I love words. Like, you just got to pull the words out. It says, as the student of the Bible beholds the Redeemer, there is awakened in the soul the mysterious power of faith, adoration, and love. It says, upon the vision of Christ, the gaze is fixed, and the beholder becomes like that which he adores. You see, the last evidence is 2 Corinthians 3. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians 3. I'm going to take you through some slides, and then we'll close it out. In 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, I behold Christ... He begins doing this awakening, miraculous work. And as he does this awakening, miraculous work, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, here goes the other part of the work of the Holy Spirit. It says in 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, it says, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, the character of God, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. How does this happen? Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. God helps us to become like Jesus. Do you love me? Jesus says, if you really love me, this would be the fruit. If you see a lacking of fruit, then there's a need for more beholding. And by the beholding, we will become changed. And it will be a miraculous work. But it's a work that God is still doing today. And I know he's doing it in your hearts. And he's doing it in mine. And he won't be satisfied until that work is perfected and completed.
In 1 Corinthians 13, we know this is the love chapter. We're told in inspiration, the Lord desires me to call the attention of his people to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Read this chapter every day and from it obtain comfort and strength. Learn from it the value that God places on sanctified, heaven-born love. And let the lesson that it teaches come home to your hearts. Learn that Christ-like love is of heavenly birth and that without it, all other qualifications are worthless. When you study 1 Corinthians 13, love is long-suffering. That means endures patiently. Love is kind, which is benevolent, desires to help others. Love envies not. It doesn't covet. It's not jealous over. Love is not puffed up, meaning boastful and proud. Love does not behave itself unseemly, which is unbecoming, indecent, and unattractive. All of these things I'm pulling from the Greek. Love is not glad. This is an interesting one. Love is not glad when wrong things happen, but only when right things happen. You ever been glad when somebody suffered because of their dumb decisions? We sometimes say, good. They deserved it. They were hard-headed. Jesus says, see, you need you need to behold a little more. You understand that? Love's not glad when bad stuff happens to people. It's only glad when good stuff happens. Love endures trials patiently, never stops trusting, is in a constant state of hope. Love is something that never stops. Not just towards friends, but also to your enemies. We all can do some more beholding. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. We're told in redemption, God has revealed his love and sacrifice, a sacrifice so broad and deep and high that it is immeasurable. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Interesting. The first three words in the beginning of the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, is God is love. The last three words in the book Great Controversy is God is love. Every other teaching is sandwiched between these, this principle. Jesus' favorite theme, did you know that volume six says Christ's favorite theme was the paternal character and abundant love of God? Jesus loves studying about love. That's why watch out for these so-called present truthers that's like, man, can we pass this love talk? Can we talk about the beast? You know, can we talk about his movements and this, that, and the third? It's like when we do that, we don't even understand. It's like, what do you mean? Christ, even Christ's favorite theme was the paternal character and abundant love of God. And there's a way you can teach about the movements of the beast power and still arrive at the love of God. You see, the only people that are going to truly win against the first and second beast of Revelation 13 are the people who have been born again with the love of God in their hearts. That's the only people that's going to make it. The greatest virtue is in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, Colossians 3, 12 through 14, love. We're told obedience to God's law and overcoming the beast is the fruit of love. Obedience to God's law and overcoming the beast. Foundation to self-sacrifice, God's love. God's love is the foundation to witnessing. This is why this should be the theme of all of our study and all of our engagement in the Word of God. So where do you begin? Where do you begin? I would like to recommend this. From the Bible standpoint, remember this. Love is mentioned 10 times in the book of Matthew. It's mentioned four times in the book of Mark. It's mentioned nine times in the book of Luke, but it's mentioned 19 times in the book of John. It's mentioned 19 times. Have you ever heard somebody say, begin studying your Bible in the Gospel of John? If you ever heard somebody say that, that's the reason why is because this is the foundation. What most SDAs are going through right now is they're going forward to go backwards to go forward again. We read the great controversy, we got fired up. I was just talking to an up and coming evangelist. I'm so excited for this brother. He's come out of the world of entertainment. He was a famous actor and he, he's a fine young man. And, and here it is that he is growing in grace in, in the Lord right now. And he's getting ready to go to one of our schools and get his training. And it's one of our blueprint schools. And he's getting ready to go there and get some training and all this stuff. And me and him were talking. And I said, brother, I said, I got to be honest with you. I said, there was a time I used to rejoice when people told me they read Great Controversy and joined the church. 
Did you catch that, that it was past tense? I used to rejoice. No, here's the reason why. Because this has happened with so many, so many individuals. I read the great controversy. I joined the church. What ends up happening is if they didn't read it right, there's nothing wrong with the great controversy. There's nothing wrong with the books. The problem is where our heads are at. And some of us talk more about the movements of the beast than the movement of the lamb. And that's a problem. So what ends up happening is there's a lot of us that end up going forward to realize that a lot of what we're moving on is not sustaining. It's not holding me. When real crisis and real trial and real drama comes, it's not enough to hold you. And then individuals start backsliding. Or they start going through some type of drama. And you know what ends up happening? I have to tell them, you need to start reading the book you love to give out but hate to read. Steps to Christ. And there are so many people that I'm like, have you ever read carefully and prayerfully the book Steps to Christ? Have you read it? Well, no. Or, yeah, like 20 years ago. And I'm like, I'd like to recommend you revisit it. And so I'm discovering with a lot of God's people, we go forward to come backwards to go forward again. And I admit, that's even my story. When I joined the church, I was all about the beast. I was studying books like Antichrist 666 and all these other books. Man, my nephew came home with a cross on his head for Ash Wednesday. That was a bad day for him. <laughs> it was a bad day for him. I told that brother, I was like, do you know what that represents? Do you understand? And, you know, I'm just hitting him up with the beast in Rome and da-da-da-da-da. But there was no Jesus. There, there was, it wasn't there because it wasn't given to me. I wanted to teach everybody about keeping God's commandments, but I forgot to introduce them to God. A sister that I'm privileged to say is a, is a, is a spiritual friend of mine, Sister Margaret Davis. Some of you are saying, mm, because you know who she is. Wrote a beautiful book, What Must I Do to Inherit Eternal Life? I mean, a true understanding of righteousness by faith. And she tells a story of a, of a relative of hers caught up in promiscuity. And she tried so hard to stop practicing promiscuity. And Sister Davis just said, you know what? Don't so much try hard to stop. She says, here's what I want you to do. You know, make your efforts to stop, what have you, but this is not where I want you to focus. She says, I just want you to learn of him every day. She just literally redirected her. Just keep learning of Jesus. Keep learning of him. Learn him. Study his mind, his character, his personality. Keep learning him. Do you know that that young lady started to do that? Before you know it, she went so long not going back into promiscuity. And she was surprised because the focus was no longer, I got to stop sinning. I just, I just got to stop sinning. I got, I got to stop sinning. Th that wasn't her focus anymore. Her focus was that I may know him. But as we read in Desire of Ages, page 22, to know God is to, and when you love God, you will keep his. It happened. And so it is. Love is mentioned 19 times in the Gospel of John. Love is mentioned 28 times in the epistles of John. So if I want to get familiar with the love of God, I want to start with the Gospel of John. I want to start with 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. That's a great area that you and I can start at. The Bible is very clear. Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And Jesus said, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And remember, Christ makes it clear. He says, the more that you study me and behold the one that you have pierced, he says, it will do its work if you do it faithfully with a willing heart. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is asking all of us this question. This is the most resounding question that should be going in our minds. He's asking you, he's asking me, do you love me? Because if you love me, bear the fruit. Feed my lambs. I want commitment from you, and I want you to feed my lambs and give them what I've given to you. Because here's the truth. 
you can only give people what you have. That's all you can give a man. That's all you can give a woman is you can only give them what you have. And so if you know love is not typically my dwelling point, love is not my focal point in my homeschooling, in my Bible classes, in my teachings, etc. We're told in the book Ministry Healing, page 460, it says, let the cross of Christ be the science of all education, the center of all teaching and all study. Talk to all the teachers and instructors in the room. Let the cross of Christ be the science of all education, the center of all teaching and all study. If we learn this science, people's hearts will be drawn to Jesus. We will be more committed. We will be more faithful. And who knows? We might even be counted amongst those who will give that loud cry and manifest the glory of God and light the earth up with his character, his character of love and faithfulness. If it is your desire to be counted amongst that number, let's stand to your feet. Let's have a word of prayer. Let's thank the Lord for what he has shown us. I thank God for these questions that Jesus asked. How about you? I thank God. Got me thinking. May God bless us as we continue to go forward in faith. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you that you challenge us with the question of your son Jesus, asking, do we really love him? Lord, I pray, help us to think about these things. Lord, help us to consider what we've learned today. Help our hearts to be faithfully turned to you, we ask. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Our closing hymn is number 510. 510.
Lord God, we thank you so much that we can truly know that you will never forsake in need the soul that trusts in thee indeed. Please, Lord, increase our faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.